welcome to the May 6th Town Council. Excuse me, please. The meeting has started. I need silence, please. Hi, meeting started. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening. Welcome to the Town Council regular meeting on May 6th. I'm calling the meeting to order. Would you please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Item number three is roll call. Council Fabine? Present. Council Donovan? Here. Council Caterina? Here. Council Blaze? Here. Council Hayes? Here. Council Chair Holbrook? I am here, and um, Councilor St. Clair unfortunately had to go home to be with his sick child this evening. Item number four is general public comments. Before we go into that, I do want to remind everyone that it is your name, address, and three minutes. We do also have rules of decorum for general public comments, which are as follows. Citizens shall direct their remarks exclusively to the council chair, as other, unless as otherwise directed by the chair. Their statements are to avoid personal, rude, or provocative remarks. All statements should respect the dignity and seriousness of the proceedings. Citizens conduct themselves in a manner expected of all meeting per participants. It shall be at the discretion of the council chair to ask any persons making inappropriate statements and or conducting themselves in a disrespectful manner to cease such action or risk being asked to be seated or removed. So um, before we come into general public comments, it uh, was brought to my attention. We do have a um, set of kids from a, a, a eighth, grade class. eighth grade class that had a quick high school, sorry, high school class that had a quick demonstration. So if you wouldn't mind, please come up to the podium. Name and address, please. Dylan Hinton, 3 Primrose Lane. McKenna Canty, 11 Bigford Street. I'm Claire Merrill, 29 Jimico Mill Road. So we are here today in... Oh. Um, we're here today in, um, in support of one-on-one uh, -on -one technology at the high school. Currently... Students have one-on-one -on -one technology from grades 9 to 12 and 3 to 8. Oh. Um, however, students at the high school don't have individual laptops and are still expected to pass and work through Google Drive. So speaking from personal experience, I have a sister who is a junior at the high school and does not have a personal laptop. Occasionally, she is forced to ask me to borrow my school laptop to submit things to her teachers through Google Drive. We think that it is unreasonable for high school teachers to expect their students to be able to provide and pay for individual laptops that they can use at home. If teachers distribute assignments digitally, students can easily review their work in all one place. Digital copies of work can also help students by making it easy to edit and change work. This can be a benefit for teachers as well. Having students turn work into Google Drive or Google Classroom is easier than collecting and sorting through stacks of paper. So this is an example of how several students can be on one document at once on Google Drive. This benefits both teachers and students because it makes their work time more productive and successful. So by each student having their own laptop, they can all join together. And you can't do this if there are not individual laptops. Oh, this is an example of uh, students using SketchUp, which is a designing, um, measuring uh, program. Um, this was used in the STEM class in tech engineering. So it's another example of how students need their laptops in their everyday student lives. This is an example on how students can check their grades on PowerSchool using their laptops. All teachers expect that students know their grades and what they've gotten on recent quizzes and tests, so if students don't have internet access at home, there's no way they can access it. So as you can see, laptops are very important for student use, and we hope that you can consider this in ne next year's budget. budget. Also, um, teachers have been using quizzes and tests more often uh, on digital because it helps them keep track of them and grade them. And right now, all, there are um, so many different ways for us to do research, and it's been noticed that it's a lot harder to do research when you have to uh, write it by paper and pencil. So it's 
it's an overall pretty good tool to have. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Can I screw this now? There we go. Alrighty, I am Jennifer Carey and I live on 17 Pumpkin Lane. I'm a senior at Scarborough High School and I am here to advocate for one-to-one -one technology. Um, I'd like you to think about this. Imagine if you walked into work one day, it's an average day, and your boss says, hey, you can't use your computer and you can't use your phone. Here is a notebook and a pencil and have a great day. So you have to research, you have to stay on those conference calls, you have to apply yourself to work without any of the technology you're used to. It must sound pretty difficult, huh? Well, that's what students face in the high school from day to day because we can't access the internet. We can't help ourselves learn because we don't have technology. And there's so many ways it can be applied, especially with the Lenovo Yogas that um, my English class is actually test running. There's so many creative ways because it's a computer and then it can turn over and it can flip into a laptop. So it can be used in art classes with the right applications, like if you have Photoshop on them and you have a stylus, which are easily like maybe one or two bucks, you can sketch out what you want to paint in art class and you can use it to take notes in physics and you can make graphs and you can take down lab notes without having to worry about cell checking and crossing things out and getting the information wrong because it's really easy to correct it. And there's... <laughs> And then it's also super easy for uh, teachers to connect with their students. Like the middle schoolers showed you, they can share Google documents with each other, and then the teachers can check in on how the students are doing on their work without, having the, without the student having to get up and go to the teacher to ask for help. It's at the tip of their fingers. And they can directly get their grades because without the need to uh, pass in papers and take notes on the papers and then hand it back, it's all done online and you can get an email or the t or it'll just give you a little icon and you'll get your grade back instantaneously. And there's no need to schedule testing anymore. I know the MEAs were super difficult on the high school and I was a senior so I didn't have to take them, but scheduling them around the juniors department with only three labs, it was time consuming and confusing for both the teachers and the students. But with one to one technology, they could get it done in one day and no one would have to worry about it. It would just be one day rather than an entire month of work and planning. And the teachers, they have to book these three labs months in advance just to even hope of getting in to get their work done. And it's insanely difficult because sometimes they'll show up with their class and someone else will already be in there. And like one of the middle school students said, not all high schoolers have personal laptops, so yet they're still expected to type their homework and have it ready to produce the next day. And that's not a feasible plan because the library doesn't have enough computers to support all the students who don't have personal computers at home. So one, te one technology would make it so much easier for everyone to get their work done on time. And, hold on one second. <laughs> and, sorry about that paper. It'd be easier if I had a laptop. <laughs> <laughs> Now that we have our, um, we've had an opportunity to hear from, from some students, um, do we, this is general public comment. You'll have three minutes to speak. State your name and address. We unfortunately don't have um, the return of our timer. <laughs> um, so Jean Marie is running, running timer for us tonight. Um, again, general public comment, just as a friendly reminder, is for non-agenda items. Hi, my name is Mike Doyle. I live at 3 Shady Lane in Falmouth. I own falmouthtoday.me. I've done a series of stories and articles about the Falmouth Police Department and what I would term misconduct. I'm here tonight to talk about post I'm here tonight to talk about post traumatic stress disorder as it applies to victims of sexual abuse. Two years ago, a man came to the police department to complain about a business owner in Scarborough who had sexually assaulted him. As far as he knows, nothing has been done about it two years later. 
the stress of being sexually abused added up to a point where he attacked the business owner here in Scarborough, seriously beating him. He's now under indictment, facing six felony counts. Had his complaint been de dealt with, and the business owner investigated, arrested, prosecuted, it's unlikely he would have come to the person's house to give him a beating. And I'd like to know, when is Andrew Cusack going to be investigated Excuse by me, Chief Moulton? Doyle, I believe it is. Yes. Um, I do want to remind you of the rules of decorum. Right. This is a public forum, and free speech still takes place in the United States. And this is freedom of speech. Uh, you, you are making some pretty hefty ac accusations. I am going uh, to I've read the court documents, ma'am. I know what I'm talking about. I know what happened to Mr. Cusack at his house. All right. You and I are out of order. Please, please be seated. Well, I want the town to know that this is an ongoing problem, just like the Biddeford Chief of Police covering up for police Mr. officers Joy, there. You are out of order. I understand that. Yeah. You, you need and to this, down. this is out of order. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Is there anybody else that wishes to speak? Excuse me. Uh, Robert Rovner, 4 King Street, uh, Pine Point. Um, Robert Rovner, 4 King Street, Pine Point. Um, I don't know how I can follow those two presentations. I don't have any kids uh, that live in town. And I have one that's 44. He lives in Arizona. And I don't have any uh, lobbies with me tonight. I was surprised that the students wouldn't have spoken under order number 15-026, as most of us other mortals are required to this evening. Um, I've been here for eight years, and for eight years we've passed substantial budgets in this town for education. Uh, tell me if you want me to stop to, to you know, file this under 15026, but um, the students in this community are extremely fortunate. $39 million budget last year, it doesn't matter if it's 39, 36, 44 doesn't matter. They're going to get a phenomenal education. Um, and yet, we're short a million dollars. We don't have a million dollars for computers in the school budget. Somehow, the town has found a way to fund a million dollars for 1,200 computers, pay it off within three years, have the, ta I'm sorry, have the taxpayers pay it off within three years, and at the end of that three-year period, They'll be obsolete, and we're going to need new computers. I don't know. If I ever came home and said to my wife, listen, I want to buy something for an extraordinary amount of money. In three years, we're going to have to get rid of it and start all over again. She would have divorced me ten times over. So I don't quite understand that. What, what I would recommend is that <clears throat> it's been recommended that this million dollars be put through as a capital improvement. Capital improvements generally aren't something like a computer. They're generally like road construction, air conditioning for the buildings, for the schools, et cetera, et cetera. I would propose to open this up to the public, to all of my fellow taxpayers, and put it on a special referendum at the time that we take the school, school vote. And let's see if they want to channel a million dollars as a capital improvement for an item that's going to be obsolete for, for 1,200 pieces that are going to be obsolete in three years. Thank you. Good evening. My name's Larry Hartwell. I live at 9 Puritan Drive here in Scarborough. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to speak tonight. I thought the budget forum last Thursday was well organized. A lot of ground was covered, and it should be considered again for next year. Um, Members of the public were respectful and quiet for the full two hours. One of the very few exceptions was when my school spending question, which was number three, was answered. I'd ask, what was the actual amount of money spent in 2010 and 2015, and what was the percentage increase? The increase was $6.9 million, 19.7%. Yes, 19.7% in five years. Based on their written response, and it looks like they used a budgeted amount for 2010 and not the actual amount spent, a difference of $1.1 million. 
taking this into consideration and still using the 2015 amount, the increase for the five-year period is 23.5%. Just one more set of numbers. In the school's written response, my question number three, they include a chart which shows an additional $3.4 million of spending. According to these figures, we have a 20.2% increase over the five years. In my follow-up question, somehow listed as number 27 on the municipal side, they explain that the amounts, in the, the amounts that are stated are not part of the school budget, which is voted on by the taxpayers. I did not know that. I thought all, I thought we were voting on everything. I thought it was all in one. So there's 3.4 million that doesn't go to the voters for their uh, approval, and I don't know how familiar the council is with that. Um, and the takeaway point is the budget has grown by at least 20% over the past five years. Now, I've served on a school board, been on the Finance Committee, uh, Negotiations, and Budget Committee. And if I was a current member of the school board, I too would be supporting the proposed budget. That would be my duty and responsibility. You are members of the Town Council. The Council and its Budget Committee have done an admirable job with the town side of the budget in both the recent past and what the Budget Committee has done to date less than 2% increase. In my opinion, the council dropped the ball either last year or the prior year when you requested the departments to come in with increases limited to 3%. All the departments complied except the school department coming in with, say, 10% and settling for 6.9%. Control of the school spending rests with and is the responsibility of the council and the budget committee. Who in this room or community has seen a 20% increase in their wages or salaries over the past 20 years? Few to none. I would ask you to consider setting the school's total budget, the school's net, total net budget increase currently at 10.13% at 3% this year. Thank you for your time. Good evening. Uh, my name is uh, William Bly, and I reside at 10 Ottawa Woods Road here in Scarborough. It feels like, once again, it's Groundhog Day. We have the same battle. Of, we're dealing with the same issues. And I just want to point a couple things out. Uh, as a concerned parent, I have to say I'm, I'm pretty amazed by the amount of work that these teachers do for our children with the very little support they get financially. Costs continue to go up every year costs for salaries and increases, health benefits, uh, the cost for health benefits go up every year, and those benefits are paired back by these companies every year. The cost of fuel go up, uh, the cost to educate our children go up when we start talking about laptops. And they've done a tremendous job with very little support. And I think what makes a community isn't the roads, it's not the stoplights, it's not the police department, it's the people and people come here for the school system. And I've said this probably three or four years in a row now. When we first made the decision to move from Portland to Scarborough, Scarborough was ranked as the number three school in the state. And again, not to take away from any of the efforts that the teachers are putting in, my son is getting a good basic education in the fourth grade. But there have been so many cutbacks. Uh, he gets music one hour once per week. And people may think that's sufficient, but the reality is music and foreign language programs that have been cut back to the bone to the point where children aren't receiving foreign language education until the eighth grade. These are things that help our children learn and their brains develop. We're doing our children a disservice by continuing to support, uh, to provide little support for the school budget. And there are hard choices. I don't pretend to want anybody's job on this committee. You have a very difficult job ahead of you to decide where you're going to cut back. Governor LePage has not made your jobs any easier, obviously, by cutting funding uh, to this community. And we've seen funding increased in other communities, and it's very frustrating. But I'm asking you to please tread lightly with the school budget issue. I know it's a political football, but people will leave the community. And to give you a personal example, we brought our child to take a look at the Waldorf School up in Freeport. We haven't made a decision. We really like the school, but again, we like the education he's receiving here. But ultimately, if we chose to send our child to a different school where we thought he would get a better overall education, that would mean we would leave the community of Scarborough. And that could be something in the long term 
that this community faces if we don't fund these budgets appropriately. Thank you. Anybody else? My name is Betsy Gleistein. I'm from 14 Longmeadow Road. Um, and I would like to um, commend the uh, Board of Education for working this year to try to subcontract some services in order to save a significant amount of money. Um, that did not work out, but there is legislation in Augusta right now, LD 1010, to allow um, schools the leeway to subcontract uh, some services. Um, uh, Representative Shiraki was asked by the Maine School Management Association to support this. I don't know where our other reps stand on it, but she did testify in support of this bill in front of the Labor Committee today, and I would urge the public, the board, and the um, town council to support LD 1010 um, so that we can find more creative solutions to uh, save money um, and uh, instead of just cuts. Deborah Fuse Sherman, 15 Fairway Drive. Um, I wanted to start out by commending um, the town council and the school board this year for the different ways that they've been doing things um, in the paper, running regular articles to inform the public um, of actually what you're dealing with as opposed to kind of hearsay and editorials and stuff has been really great and the fact that you're working together. Um, I'd just like to, a couple points. Um, Scarborough does have a great educational system. Um, but we live in a global community, and if you look outside of Maine, look to Massachusetts, um, to other countries, they really put education a lot higher on their list, um, and our students are going to be competing in the national and world arena. Um, I also want everyone to think about what their education was like when they went to school. Um, I'm unfortunately over the median age of a person who lives in Maine, <laughs> so I'm part of the problem, the graying problem. Um, when I went to school, we just had a regular old telephone, no cell phones. Um, I went to college, and cutting edge at the college was a computer lab where we could do our papers on a word processing thing, um, and I took basic computer programming. That was about it. That was cutting edge at a private, education, uh, a private college. If you think now, I mean, to really compete, have a laptop, have a cell phone, it's, you can't do without that. And I have two students now at the high school. You know, we're fortunate enough to be able to have bought them laptops. I don't know how they could do without it. They're working hours and hours in the evening, looking up sources, um, writing their papers, they could not be good students without their computers. And I feel really poorly for the people in this community who can't give that to their kids. We also, you know, I know this isn't part of it, but we also don't have leap buses, and a lot of other communities do. And students that don't have a parent that can come get them um, can't do any after-school activities. Um, teams, tutors, you know, extra help from teachers, that kind of thing. So. I'm not, I know that there might be some compromises on the kind of computers we get, you know, maybe not touch screen, maybe we do it over a two year period, um, but I really think to be able to compete, um, just like a lot of the communities around Southern Maine have already done, we really need to look into the one-on-one -on -one technology and we need to think about long term planning for this community as opposed to just the one year budget and uh, hitting the schools, which they can't raise their own revenue, they can't increased fees, um, things like that, which a lot of people, uh, uh, the municipal side can do. Um, and they've been hit from the state um, year after year, too, with decreased funding. So unfortunately, the town has to come up with, or try to come up with some of the difference. Thank you. Anybody else? And just a friendly reminder, we do have um, an agenda item for a public hearing for the budget. So um, general public comments are for non-agenda items. So um, if there's anybody that 
I mean, so is this the by. time to talk about the budget or not? We do have a public hearing a little later in the evening. Um, I'll, I'll wait then. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Does anybody else wish to speak on a non-agenda item? Uh, all right, well, seeing none, we'll go ahead and move right on into the next item, which is item number five, minutes of the April 15th, 2015 regular meeting. Is there a motion? Full approval. Second. And any discussion? Yeah, submissions, all right. Seeing none, all those in favor, and that is unanimous. <coughs> item number six is adjustment to the agenda. I, we have none at this time. So item number seven is the treasurer's warrants, which I will sign throughout the meeting later. And item number eight, non-action items, we have none at this time. So moving along into order number 14-103, the 7 p.m. public hearing and schedule a second reading on the proposed First Amendment to contract zone three, Maine Life Care Retirement Community, Inc., located at 15 Piper Road. So again, this is a public hearing. Does anybody wish to speak on this item? Good evening. My name is Ron Epstein. I represent Piper Shores. With me here tonight is Jim Adamovich, the uh, CEO of Piper Shores, and Michael Tatamo Wideland the, uh, from Faith Crawford, who's doing the civil engineering for the project. I'll be brief since this is, this is our third time before you, but we started last September with a joint workshop uh, with the town council and the planning board. We then refined the plan. Uh, and met with you in December in which you gave preliminary approval for the plan which would be limited to uh, uh, at that time 28 new assisted living units all to be built over the existing parking lot and a small arts building. Uh, since that time we've been before the planning board and the planning board has granted preliminary site plan and subdivision approval for the project uh, and so we're here tonight for uh, the first formal reading on the amendment to the contract zone. The only changes since what you saw in December 2014 are the addition of two additional assisted living units uh, and a $40,000 contribution to the affordable housing fund. Uh, other than that, uh, the, the project is as presented. It will be a total of 30 assisted living units, 14 of which are for memory care and all of those will be built over the existing uh, parking lot at Pike for sure. Thank you, and we're pleased to answer any questions. Thank you for that introduction. Um, again, this is a public hearing. Is there anybody that wish, wishes to speak on this item? All right, and seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. And pleasure of the council? Move okay. approval. The second, second. Reading, second reading. The second reading will be scheduled for May 20th. Oh, oh, oh. I have a paperwork. All right, that's second. Well, we don't jump in the gun on that one. So <laughs> there is no second reading. Um, is there any questions from the council uh, on this item? <laughs> All right. And um, I do just want to just kind of recap. Um, I do want to thank Piper Shores for coming back. And uh, um, certainly there was some, some debate about um, in this particular contract about having a um, affordable provision somehow. Um, so I am quite happy to see see that get added in as they um, create some momentum and some movement for some affordable housing. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. order number 15-026 is public hearing on the proposed fiscal year 2016 municipal school budget. So feel free to go ahead and line right up and then you can head right up to the into the hallway if we have to. Um, but name, address, and you do have three minutes for the public hearing. Good evening. My name is Kelly Murphy. I live at 5 Woodfield Drive, and I'm also a member of the school board. And I generally prefer to save my remarks for the school board meetings, but when I would like an audience, I have to come here because nobody comes to our meetings. <laughs> <laughs> um, my message tonight is to really defend the school board and defend the school leaders. It seems that I have to come to this meeting every year to um, defend our intentions and our intelligence. We are good and conscientious stewards of taxpayers' money. Three of the seven members of the school board were on the steering committee for Wentworth Building Committee. 
The administrators that we also employ today were instrumental in designing the incredibly intelligent, practical building you see today. Not only was the project $3 million below the amount overwhelmingly approved by voters, we will also close the books with an additional quarter million dollars ready to pay down the principal on existing bonds. We built that school to state standards with one exception, the artwork. A state-funded project requires 1% of the total budget to be spent on the inclusion of public art. The amount spent for the gorgeous stained glass sculpture at Wentworth was a tiny fraction of what would re be required by the state. The only reason anyone around town remembers what the art cost, $40,000, not $80,000, by the way, is because of my actual my plan to implement the donor brick program in an effort to offset some costs to taxpayers. To date, the ongoing fundraiser has reached about half, a little over half of its original goal, and at that point, we were under no obligation to come up with any creative financing for the art. We had the money. We were under budget. That was something we did above and beyond to try to lessen the, bur the burden on taxpayers. And the point of all that is to inform you that Wentworth students are using laptops today for grades three through five every day. They're using this week for mandatory online standardized testing. And because of the incredible negotiation and research skills of Jennifer Lim and the forethought in, of the steering committee to pursue one-to-one -one for our students at base, bargain basement pricing. The same outstanding work ethic and attention to detail was put into action again over the course of two years to develop the one-to-one -one laptop proposal for the high school. This isn't a quick money grab, as I've heard described by detractors. This is a necessary proposal to give our students the tools they need to learn and succeed in 2015. Providing a school-owned laptop to our high school students is no more a gift to our students than a math book, microscope, indoor plumbing, or electricity. The idea that parents should have to buy the laptops is not only morally reprehensible, but also against state law. Computers are the textbook of 2015. Our surrounding districts have already recognized that, and their students have had that advantage for many, many years. We cannot and will not charge a student to access a basic element for learning. I will just wrap up to say that you all have um, iPads provided by the town. You are not expected to do your job without it. Let's stop playing politics with our students and allow them the same opportunity. Thank you. Good evening. Donna Bealy, and I'm the Scarborough School Board Chair. Among the many responsibilities of the school board, we are charged with evaluating and analyzing the school budget and then bringing forth a responsible budget. You elected us to do that, and that is exactly what we have done. This year, the loss of state revenues along with the additional increases in fixed costs and unfunded state mandates have caused the board to arrive at a strictly needs-based budget with a meager increase of less than 1% in school improvement. The two finance committees have worked very hard this year to answer all the questions presented by our citizens on the municipal and school side. All the answers to the school questions from our community are on the website, should you have any. The state school funding formula or general purpose aid to schools is not going to change in the near future. A few years ago, the legislature commissioned an organization to evaluate the appropriateness of the school funding formula. The results outlined in the PICUS report found that Maine is doing quite well in comparison to other states with regards to how we fund schools. Our legislators tell us that compared to other towns, Scarborough is considered a wealthy town due to property valuations. In their minds, this town has the means to provide for our town and our schools. We are near the bottom in terms of the mill rate in Cumberland County. The school budget reflects needs that include less than 1% in actual school improvement. It's a very lean budget. It includes only three full-time positions, of which two are absolutely must be provided for to comply with special education needs by law. Regarding computers, these are essential learning tools. You know that. 
They are the textbooks of today. They will not be less expensive next year. Our IT director and the school staff have just spent two years doing the extensive research and, and analysis to determine the best options for our high school technology needs. It would be very difficult for average citizens to fully understand the complexities of this issue and the educational implications since it just took us two years to really look at that. I urge you to let the school budget, as proposed, go to the voters. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Jody Shea. I am a parent uh, of two children here in the school department. I live at 23 Windsor Pines Drive and I'm also on the school board. I think I've covered everything. Um, I'm here tonight to show you, not tell you about, but show you what high school students are currently learning from. I got my hands on a few textbooks. Um, one of them is a biology book. The other is a global science book. This global science book is 10 years old. The biology book is 12 years old. And my favorite, the world history book, is 17 years old. <laughs> Older than most of the students in our high school. I decided to see how things have changed since these books were published. In the global science book, I looked up world population information. The book states our world population is 6 billion. When I went online, I used my device. I used my tool that I had. I found a website that tells me to the second what our world population is. Today at 12.30, it was 7.3 billion, not the 6 billion this book mentions. This information is at my fingertips up to the minute. The website broke it down by country. I could have looked to see what the population change was in China at that moment. I could have done a lot more things. This tool that I was using, a laptop helps me, the learner, dig deeper. The information I found was so much more in-depth and frankly, more accurate. Then I opened up the history book. Again, this is World History published in 1997. Keeping that in mind, let me tell you the things this book doesn't tell our students. The World Trade Center attacks, September 11th, 2001, it's not in here. Hurricane Katrina in 2005, not in here. Water discovered on the moon in 2009. Since this book was published, Bill Clinton has finished his second term, George W. Bush has had two terms, and we've elected our first African-American president. None of that is in this book. British troops have withdrawn from Afghanistan, but you wouldn't even know there was a war in Afghanistan by reading this book. The one-to-one -one technology initiative does not just allow our students to Google something and find information like I did today. It creates an environment of exploratory learning, which results in independent learners and thinkers. It opens up a global community. Our students have real-time access to resources that enhance their understanding of a topic. There is more opportunity to, cu to customize learning for the individual, and students can learn at the pace that works for them. The list of benefits goes on and on. This is a way that students learn today. They are a part of a digital world, and we need to make sure that we are providing an opportunity for them to be on an equal playing field with their peers. Laptops and technology, however scary that sounds to some of us, is the textbook of today. This is part of the learning that needs to happen in the year 2015. We are not breaking new ground here. We are not on the cutting edge of technology with this. Um, we're at the back end of that spear. So I will end, because I hear Jean Marie <laughs> singing. Um, as it stands now, I feel we are failing our students. If we don't provide tools that they need to learn in the 21st century, we're not providing an appropriate education. We fail as parents for not voicing our concerns. We fail as leaders in this town for not providing the necessary tools. And we fail as a community because you better believe businesses will look elsewhere as families choose other towns to live in. Good evening, Chris Chiazzo, 17 Elmwood Avenue, and I think I'm rounding out the end of the school board's commentary, so I'll try and be brief. Um, I'd like to start by thanking Councillor Baybine, Councillor Donovan, and Councillor Hayes for the extra time and efforts they each put into making our joint finance meetings a success. I believe we made great strides this year in improving communications between our two governing bodies and have moved the town's budget process forward in a much more positive, deliberate, and hopefully predictable manner. 
While I believe the process has been a positive one for both sides, it hasn't been without its challenges. Uh, we received, and perhaps the Council has as well, a revised CIP proposal for our one-to-one -one computer request for the high school. Ordinarily, this would have been an ideal forum to discuss such an issue, especially considering the volatility among the townspeople surrounding this particular item in the school CIP budget. There were, however, two very critical issues with this that I found very challenging. First, in an attempt to shift costs away from the initial capital request, the proposal called for an annual fee to students of $100. I'm sure many of you outside the school system do not see a problem with this, but it does create some concerns for me personally. While I agree parents and or students should be responsible for the costs associated with maintenance, which they are at the elementary and middle school levels, I think such a fee uh, is inappropriate because unlike sports, clubs, or parking for that matter, which one could co argue are elective, the laptops are an essential educational component much like a textbook. Every student will be required to use the laptop without exception. There is no opt-out. This doesn't even begin to consider the complex policy and enforcement challenges such an arrangement would create. We move to a pay-to-play system for athletics and activities in order to maintain good programs for our students while stretching our limited resources. This fee, in effect, would amount to a paradigm shift in public education, or what I may call pay-to-learn. Second, but perhaps most disturbing, was the fact that the proposal did not come from the school board or from the school administrators. It came from the town through the direction of the shared IT services model. There was no consult consultation, discussion, or notification to or by the school board that this revision was being explored or that it was to be presented as a revised proposal in the joint format. The only reason for me m my mentioning this is to clear up any misconceptions that the Council of the Public may have regarding the one-to-one -one proposal and remind the Council of the clear separation of powers between the school board and the Council. Unlike other town departments, by virtue of the town charter as well as state law, neither the Council nor town administrators have line item authority over the school budget. In spite of the perceived breach of protocol, the school board and finance committee will take the suggested changes under advisement when we meet again tomorrow evening. It is my hope moving forward we will continue to be able to work together to come up with a mutually agreeable compromise that will allow this laptop initiative to move forward based on its merits and not on financial gimmicks. Finally, I'd like to leave you with some general thoughts as we once again consider making reductions to the proposed education budget. One very clear indication of a community's priorities is how they choose to spend their resources, however limited they may be. Sorry, I hear that. I'll, I'll try and wrap it up. Um, as you know, Scarborough, like every municipality in Maine, is required to file an annual audit report with finances. These reports follow a consistent format across the state, and each town's report can be found on the state's website. In response to the continued cries from, this, from some that the education budget is out of control, I took last year's USA Today list of top 10 high schools in Maine and cross-referenced their towns with recent audit reports to see what percentage of expenses they dedicate to education. Falmouth, which was ranked number two, spends 65.7 cents of every dollar on education. Number three, Yarmouth, spent 65.6 cents. Number four, Cape, 65.7 cents. Number five, Kennebunk, 60.6 cents. And finally, Scarborough, which dropped from number seven the previous year to number 10 last year, spent 53.7 cents of every dollar on education. While admittedly I only looked at one year's worth of audit data, we shared 20 years worth of Scarborough school spending with the Town Finance Committee, which clearly shows a consistent underfunding of education in Scarborough. So my hope moving forward as we continue to work together is that eventually as a community we can begin to view our schools as the assets for growth, prosperity, and quality of life, much like our neighbors do, instead of burdensome tax liabilities like some in town want to portray them. Then maybe instead of shifting the burden onto property tax increases or tax-paying parents, through pay to play and now possibly pay to learn, we can work together giving our future and our children a more equitable share of the existing pie. Thank you. Good evening, Mike Turek, 11 Bayberry Lane. I do not want to talk about laptops. <laughs> uh, I do want to talk about the school budget though. And I feel like I'm pretty much alone here. There's a room full of people here that I know support the school budget. Please hear me out and don't throw any knives. <coughs> Please do not allow the present school budget to go to the voters. There was quite a bit of time spent at the Joint Finance Committee presenting arguments to support the school budget. Argument one was that the 20-year trend for the school budget is acceptable. 
In my opinion, that's an old statistical trick that if you don't like the present spikes in the graph, you run it back 20 years and the slope decreases. The only way to smooth out the jumps in the last three years is to go back. Uh, that's why it was done that way, in my opinion. Argument two, the CPI is not a good measure for determining the school budget. The CPI is something I thought of last year when I was announced as a writing candidate for the school board. Because when that's combined with the rate of inflation and the rate of unemployment, you get a pretty good indication of what the economy's health is. <laughs> that health is translatable to affordability, and affordability is what I'm talking about. We can afford budget hikes that come close to the CPI or to the rate of inflation. That's why I chose that metric. In my opinion, again, we cannot afford increases that go above that. The third argument presented is that the school budget is not responsible for the rapid rise in taxes. The state is. Well, three or four years ago, the school budget was here and had a projected course that would take it up to take care of what was termed the Draculean cuts to the budget. At that time, State funding was here, and it's gone down. Uh, the figure that's used is 58%, so it's down over here now. What we have is a huge gap, and that is the affordability gap. And that's what's generated when the school funding from the state was reduced. To simply say we're going to continue on this course that takes the school budget up, in my opinion, is irresponsible to the rest of the town. Some gentleman mentioned that the town's made up of people. Yeah, and some of them need a little relief here. Please don't take the 20-year graphs or the arguments that the state's responsible for the school budget. I sold a set of locks and doors today. I heard it at Lowe's to a man and woman that are leaving town because of the taxes. He said, I might as well leave now before I have to sign over my Social Security check to him. Thank you. Uh, my name is Dick Springer. I live at Piper Shores, 15 Piper Road. Uh, I want to address issues that were well, partly mentioned by the previous speaker and by a couple of speakers in the general comment period. I think past history of, court of costs is not relevant, that we should focus on current requ requirements and uh, what our current needs are, and simply in dollar and cents terms, uh, underfunding our school system is foolish because uh, the quality of our schools affects people's uh, desire to live in this community. and. Um, the, and that, in turn, affects property values. That's talking purely in terms of dollars and cents, not in terms of values. Um, and um, I think the, the, the focus should be on what is required to have a high-quality school system that provides excellent education for students and is attractive to people uh, with, young, with children who, so they want to live in this community. Now, um, the... Education, in, in simply talking about economics and not other values, education has an economic value that is much greater for individuals than it had in mo much of the past. Uh, inequality is increasing in this country, and people with out, w without high-quality educations are doing uh, more and more poorly economically, and ed economic or a good ex education is really the key to economic prosperity, and I think we're, uh, it's foolish uh, to rob our children of the opportunities that a good school system provides. And we have to make choices. I think people may be stressed, some of them, and we should try to pressure the state to 
uh, provide more revenue sharing, but uh, I think we have to pay what it costs to provide excellent education for our, our children. And I think our, our, our property values depend on it and our, the future of the country and the future of the people of Scarborough depends on it. Hi, my name is Cindy Kuick and I live at Six Moors Point Road. There is a lot of people why, a lot of reasons why people live in Scarborough. I think people move here because of the beaches. I think we're really close to Portland, which is really attractive to a lot of people. Um, the schools are excellent, and the mill rate is significantly lower than any of the other surrounding towns. When I moved here, I did not have children. I didn't have children for the first five years that I lived here, and the reason we chose Scarborough was because of all those things, plus because of the low mill rate. Um, all of those things today still are in place, even though time has gone by. Uh, we do have a whole bunch of social strata in Scarborough. We have people with a lot of money, and we have people with not very much money. And we have a responsibility to take care of all of those citizens. Uh, we're going to use computers as an example. There are families who cannot afford to go out and buy their child a new laptop so that they can go through high school. It's just not in their budget. If you've ever lived on a tight budget, you know you can't find an extra $700 to do that for every single one of your children. We as a town have a responsibility to give them equal opportunity and equal chances. Our school board has consistently been fiscally responsible. Our cost per student is less than any other town in the surrounding areas, and we still provide an excellent education. So to imply that the budget that they're presenting is not responsible and conservative and taking into account the budgets of all people in the town, I think is really disingenuous. They really have tried to not put costs super high. Because of that, I think that we should present this budget to the voters. I understand that there are people, again, as I said, of all social strata in town, and I think there are people who need assistance. There's retirees who are on a fixed budget. Unfortunately, the only say we have is in the school budget, so that's where it always gets hammered. I think that there are issues that need to be addressed, but I don't think it's fair to take away from the school budget to try to fix other problems. Perhaps we can address those in other places. So I guess what I'm saying is that our school board has presented fiscally conservative budgets consistently over the years. Let's present this to the town, see what the voters say, and then we can go from there. Hi, Drew Stevens, 6 Surrey Lane. Um, hope, first of all, I guess I'm only speaking once. I don't know if any other people are getting up again who spoke earlier, but I hope just because we speak once, it doesn't mean we believe any less in what we're saying than people who are speaking to you two or three times saying their opinions. Um, I, uh, I guess I've only been paying attention to what's going on in Scarborough for the last few years, and really this year I've made even more of an effort to kind of come to all the meetings and hear what everyone has to say on the town council and the school board. Um, and one thing that is a little bit concerning is it's turning into this big us versus them situation. Um, and I don't think it's us versus them. I haven't heard anyone come up and say, you know, I hate children and I don't think they should learn. It's, it's kind of silly that we're put in this little box to, to sit here and say we have to go through every line item of the school board. I think it's disrespectful to the school board that they sit there and spend countless hours putting together a budget to give the best school education to our children that they can, and then everyone who wants to can sit there and scrutinize every single line item and say, well, what about this, and why not this, and why are we buying this? I think it would be crazy for us to sit here and tell the police chief, why do you need to do that? What do you need those uniforms for? What's the, what's the deal with this armor? Why do you need this? It's silly for someone like myself to sit there and go through every line item on the police budget or the fire department or anywhere else. And that's what's happening with our school budget. And to be honest with you, if I was in this position where $20 more a month would really put a damper on my, on my family, I might say no to the school budget the way it is too because it's the only chance I have to say no, not because I'm against the schools. So I really wish that this conversation can be broadened a little bit so people who don't want to spend any more money 
can say no to something else. Maybe they don't like the granite beach signs, and they would say no to that instead of no computers for our children. Um, the fact that we're arguing or discussing computers for our children is ludicrous. It's 2015. Who doesn't learn how to use a computer and expect to be competitive in anything? I don't care what you do. It's crazy that we're even having this discussion. Of course we need computers for our children. And we can't ask every the same people that are saying we don't have money to spend, we're going to ask those same people to go ahead and pay for a computer for their children? It, do, it doesn't make sense. So I guess I just would like us to start giving a little bit more weight to what the school board puts into this and a little less weight to people who are going to say no to spending money because they can't spend more money, not because they're against the school board. And let's open up a chance for them in the future to maybe say no to something else besides just school budget. Thank you. Don't let me forget my purse. <laughs> Um, I'm Betsy Gleistein. I'm from 14 Long Meadow Road, um, and um, the uh, I, I do have some questions around the laptops because we've heard quite a bit that they're new, they're the new textbooks. So I would like to understand: Are there savings associated with the laptops? Um, and I did look at all the proposals, but hopefully there's something buried in there about that. Um, I guess um, I am one of the morally reprehensible ones because I can afford a laptop and I would be happy to pay for it for my son so that he would, we well, don't have to burden the taxpayers of Scarborough who can't afford that. And I certainly um, would want to supplement anyone who couldn't afford that. Um, but. Uh, I applauded the donor brick program because um, I don't understand why we don't do more capital campaigns like that for things that we talk about. We've got to stop burdening people. Why don't we do more things like that? I was at the Yarmouth um, Sports Complex and they have granite signs that say this was part of our capital campaign. I think those types of things would be, would be great. And I think the great thing about the donor brick program was that it showed the taxpayers that there was an intent there. And I think we could do the same things um, around the laptops. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think that's a morally bad thing to do. I think it's a good thing to do. Um, I, I, I don't understand the entire thing, I'm sure, but I do understand plain old words and plain old charters. It's over $400,000, put it to a vote. Let's stop playing the games. It's capital, it's over 400. And when we do a fire truck, we'll buy this part or we'll buy that part and we won't put it to a vote. That needs to stop. And I would urge you, and I, I applaud uh, Councillor Baybine at the, um, the Q&A session where he said the council is considering a vote for both the town budget as well as the school budget. Because where I do agree with the previous speaker is that um, when people are upset about spending, they can only count they can only register one vote, and I think that is a disservice to the school board. Um, and I personally have a lot, a lot of questions on the line items. I know um, maybe people don't, as Drew just said, he doesn't. Um, but I would like to know how do I get those very specific answers so I can decide how I'm going to vote on those line items. Um, that's what I would, I would really like to understand, maybe somebody can you know, tell me how to do that. Um, I won't ask them here tonight. I'll submit them in writing because um, we don't have that kind of time tonight. Um, but uh, you know, the main point I'd like to say is I really urge a vote on the laptops and I urge a consideration with a public meeting to talk about the laptops and a capital campaign. Um, and I urge the uh, town to uh, put the, the, the town budget to a vote as well. Thank you. I'm Larry Hartwell, 9 Puritan Drive. Um, first of all, I'd like to say I support the laptops. I was at the joint budget meeting the other day, listened to the arguments and discussion on that, asked a couple of questions, um, and I'm four square behind that. Uh, everyone probably in this room has one, uses one. We, we know the, the utility of them. and so I think we need to do that. Um, 
at, at, that bud, um, at that budget meeting, the school board committee asked the, the town's budget committee for specific recommendations on the school budget and was told by the chair that by law they can't do that, that they only look at the bottom line and not the details. And I just wanted, there had been a remark earlier this evening about the uh, impropriety or, or whatever you want to call it by the budget committee. So there was, that happened there. So getting back to just dollars and cents, that's what the, the town council is all about is the bottom line, not getting into the weeds of the school budget. If I was interested in the weeds, I'd go to the school bu budget committee the, and the school board and, and drown in the weeds. Um, so I'm just looking at, again, a 20% increase over five years. Who has this kind of increase? We've kept the, the town budgets, the other uh, departments, at zero to three percent. We don't, as taxpayers, have the ability to pay this type of increase year in and year out. Thank you. Hi, I'm Wally Fengler. I live at uh, 233 Holmes Road in Scarborough. I've been a resident here for 50 years, and my wife taught here for over 30 years. So uh, before I get to what I wanted to talk about, I wanted to respond to some of the things that I heard tonight, that the computer is a textbook. And I un understand that it's a tool, but it costs a lot more. And then I heard mention about uh, uh, that the textbooks were obsolete, that there was data that is current. My wife taught current events. She watched the news every night, and that's how her students learned the updated information. So I have a little bit of, I have a laptop just like probably everybody does, or an iPad, but what's to keep them focused on, they still need the teacher and some of the problems, I think, is whether we keep the kids focused on learning. So I just wanted to make that comment. My main reason for coming up here is that my property taxes went up. I, I calculated over six years. It went up 25%, but I'll stick with the 20 that I've heard tonight. My retirement annuity went up 8.4% in that time period. So the total that my tax bill went up was $1,596 in that time period. I'm sorry, $1,926. And my income went up $1,596. So every year I'm getting more and more squeezed because everything else is going up as well. So I, I'm in favor of, of keeping the tax rate close to what the consumer price index is because my wife keeps telling me we got to sell our house and move out of town, and I don't think that's fair after I've lived here for 50 years and supported education all that time. Thank you. Uh, Robert Rovner, 4 King Street, Pine Point. Um, I want to remind everybody that the town council doesn't tell the school board how to spend their money. The town council only votes on an amount that the school board is going to have to work with. Um, I'm not one to um, be indirect um, at all, ever. And um, I don't know how to be that way. But I will tell you that I sat here tonight and listened to the majority of the people here, and everybody has blamed or lobbied the council for these laptops. I don't know how it got there. So you have to enlighten me. Because this is not a town issue necessarily for you as the governing board to make this a capital improvement. This is an educational issue that the Board of Education should be working on to use as of their budget. Over $39 million last year in budget. They want a 12% increase. You're going up to $44 million. 
you're raising the CPI, I'm sorry, the mill rate up over 8% to every homeowner in this town. That includes well, everybody on the board. And you think that when you ask somebody to pay $100 towards a computer, that that's not right, but you can raise their taxes. So if their home is worth 300000 for every 300000 the taxes are going up $383. Do you think they would rather give out 100 bucks for a computer or spend another $383 based on 300000 If it's 600000 they're up over $700 a year. I don't get it. And I don't get how the board here, I'm sorry, the council, got to the point of approving this as a capital improvement and putting it on the back of everybody here and, and not making this a school board issue within their budget. That's where it belongs. Thank you. Hi, uh, Kim Gambardella, 6 Howard Lane. Um, thank you for having this meeting, giving us the opportunity to express our thoughts and feelings on the proposed budget. Um, I also really appreciated the joint meeting last Wednesday uh, as an opportunity to continue to be educated on the budget and the process. I moved to Maine five years ago from Pittsburgh. We chose Scarborough as a town to raise our family mainly because of the schools, and we love it here. We love this community. I have three kids, a first grader at Eight Corners, a fourth grader at Wentworth, and a sixth grader at the middle school. And unfortunately, I'm watching all three of my children have a different educational experience because of the reductions in programs over the last five years. It's disappointing that my kids won't all have the opportunity to have foreign language classes during their time at Wentworth or play seventh grade middle school sports. I'm watching my youngest first grader's class size be 50% larger than my daughter's was just three years prior. And I'm concerned about things like the three primary schools having to share nurses. My first grader has a life-threatening food allergies. And yes, everyone at the school is trained. But as a mother who worries about that every single day her child goes off to school, I want to know there's a full-time nurse there. God forbid he have any anaphylactic reaction during the school day. Our kids cannot afford to see any more reductions. We're underfunding our schools. So I support the school budget. I ask you to please support the school budget. We owe it to our kids to invest in them and education in our town. So in summary, please allow the budget as presented by the elected school board to go to voters on June 9th. Thank you. Hi, I'm Paula O'Brien on View Drive. I'm going to wing it because, honest to God, my computer quit on me before I came, and I've not yet fit a personal desktop computer into my home budget yet. Um, I've lived here in Scarborough for most of my life, and I'm a 1977 Redskin graduate. I tell you this not to feel more privileged than newcomers in town, but because there are people that have been here for a long time, and these people will speak to me. They're afraid to speak for themselves because they are either too proud or they will be considered anti-school or, worse yet, anti-children when nothing could be further from the truth. Some of them have felt comfortable speaking to me. Um, and some of them have expressed that they cannot afford um, a huge increase beyond reasonable in their tax bill. And some of those include, yes, a mother of three who's hoping she can afford to stay here so that her last child can graduate. A retired man in his early 80s, still in his own home, already is talking of which medications he can give up because he doesn't want to discontinue cable TV because that is what he has to do all day. There's also three people who have had serious medical conditions in their family that's depleting their finances. There's 90 plus families whose children are provided backpacks at the beginning of the school year by Kiwanis because they cannot even afford those. There's also families helped with their oil bill each year by Project Grace graciously. Um, I'm going to skip over to, uh, I, I was also informed by a state representative that this million dollar decrease in state funds is not yet set in stone. It was pointed out to me that while Scarborough may experience a million dollar reduction, Westbrook too is looking at more than a million dollar in, in reduction. But when comparing Westbrook with our town, their school budget is only up $420,000 or 1.2%. Scarborough's is up 3.3 million or 7.6%. And let me mention debt. 
I'll bet most people don't even realize that Scarborough was paying over $6.3 million annually on debt service, and over $3.5 million of that is just interest alone. We may be near the bottom in the mill rate, but we are much higher in valuation than surrounding towns. In the end, something has to be done because next year and the year after that, it's not going to get any better. It's going to be the same thing, large tax increases. And whether it is a casino, much to the dismay of others, there are some that are looking at that. I've mentioned before that I feel that 50, more 55-plus neighborhoods would be beneficial to Scarborough in that it doesn't provide more kids to the school at $12,000 each you know, to educate, but it would provide more property taxes by huge amounts every year. Um, I want to commend the Community Services Department for maintaining a nearly flat budget for years. And yes, while they have revenue, it, so does the town in tax dollars. Um, they've maintained all the 22-plus school athletic fields and some snow removal and scheduling of fields, among other things. Um, that are in their budget that are not in the school budget like so many surrounding towns that are being compared to in the per student cost. That number per student cost is actually higher here in Scarborough than what is being presented. So for the sake of many in town and uh, who are in tough personal situations, I ask the town council to take a stand for those that cannot take much more of these huge increases and ask for more of a reasonable increase. Thank you. Hello, Jennifer Carey, 17 Scarborough Lane again. Uh, Scarborough Lane, my goodness, I'm a little bit tired today. Funkin' Lane. And I'm here to actually talk a little bit about the textbook situation at Scarborough, as I've heard some other people bring up. They are really sadly out of date. I take AP Psychology, and our textbook was 12 years old. And if you think, in the terms of psych psychological advancements in the past 12 years, by the time we got our new textbooks, which are digital, by the way, and are very hard to access without a laptop because the, the font can't be run on a phone and there aren't enough computers to go around school for everyone to be able to access the textbook at the same time. It was astounding to me how what we were learning, what we were studying day in and day out, what we were learning for homework, it wasn't right. That I had to relearn everything just to take the AP test on Monday just so I could hope of getting a good score and we needed these textbooks to be updated. And Online textbooks, which we have, are a fraction of the cost. So in the long run, if we ch decided to replace physical textbooks with digital textbooks and a laptop, we would be saving so much money. And as a senior in high school, I sadly do not have the figures to support that because I'm 18. I don't have access to this kind of stuff. <laughs> so just think about it. The world is changing, and we need to change along with it. What else can we do? Thank you. All right. Does anybody else wish to speak on this item? Public hearing. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Chrissy Cassio. I live at 10 Howard Lane. And I wasn't planning to speak tonight, um, but I, after listening to everyone here in the room tonight, I feel as though I would be doing my children a disservice if I did not speak tonight. I have two children. Um, one is in fourth grade at the Wentworth School, and one is in seventh grade at the middle school here in Scarborough. We moved here uh, about six years ago, um, specifically for the schools. Um, and we have, over the last few years, continued to, to have to fight um, for the funding and continued to see programs eliminated. And I can tell you it is very discouraging for parents, and I cannot tell you the number of conversations that I have had over the past year with parents who are considering sending their, their children in this town to private school or considering moving out of this town. And it is such a shame because these teachers are doing such a great job with the minimal resources that they have available to them. So I urge you to please uh, bring this proposed budget to vote so that we all, all have an opportunity to vote on this. Thank you. Again, if you do wish to speak on this item, please do just line right up at the podium. 
Alex Mabrady, 15 uh, Bayberry Lane. Um, I got here late, so I apologize if any of this is redundant. Um, I just want to voice my support uh, for the uh, proposed school budget as is. Um, you know, and I think you know my partner and I moved here four years ago uh, for same constellation, same constellation of reasons that a lot of young families moved to Scarborough, um, which are the proximity to Portland the outdoor amenities, and the good schools. Now, my partner and I actually have no interest uh, in having children, uh, have no interest in uh, really utilizing the school system much, but I do understand what the, the value that the school adds uh, to my house because I know how many of my friends are trying to find property in Scarborough, move to Scarborough as they start to have uh, young families. Um, so I think, you know, if we want to drive down the value of our houses, if we um, want to make uh, Scarborough less competitive than Falmouth, Cape Elizabeth, Cumberland, South Portland, then we should continue to underfund our schools if we want to be less competitive. If we want to be more competitive and make sure that all of us get a very good deal someday when we sell our houses, um, and if we want um, an educated workforce for the future, not perpetuate cycles of poverty, uh, then we have to fund public education, and it has to be a top priority. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? All right. Saying none, we'll go to the public hearing. Order number 15-029 is a public hearing and action on the new request for a food handler's license from SNK Company LLC, doing business as JoJo's Thai Kitchen, located at 183 U.S. Route 1, Suite F. Again, this is a public hearing. Does anybody wish to speak on this item? And seeing none, I will close the public hearing on this item in the pleasure of the council. Move approval. Second. Second. And any discussion? No. And no. All right. Seeing none, um, all those in favor? And that is unanimous. Order number 15-030 is a 7 p.m. public hearing and action on a new request for a massage therapist license from Nancy J. Stuvenant. Thank you. <laughs> Doing business at Focal Point Manual Therapies located at 7 Oak Hill Terrace. And again, this is a public hearing. Does anybody wish to speak on this item? None. I will close the public hearing and pleasure of the council. Move approval. Second. Anybody any discussion? All right. Seeing none, all those in favor? And that is unanimous. Order number 15-031 is 7 p.m. public hearing and joint meeting between the town council and the planning board on the proposed contract zone from Avesta to establish a 15-unit, a 50-unit, Affordable housing development at 577 U.S. Route 1. Um, you know, I think we'll... It's a quick recess while we... Yeah, we'll break for five minutes and so we can yeah. set up and then reconvene. I had something different uh, next. Yeah, we're breaking. Yeah, yeah. I had something different next. Yeah, I had different...
Chair, and I'm, like you said, I'm certainly going to introduce this um, and kind of go over the, the contract zoning process because it's not, um, you know, every meeting that you go through the contract zoning process, it's used sparingly in the community, so um, it's worth kind of walking through the, the steps. Um, I also wanted to kind of mention that the timing of this application is, is, is pretty interesting as it relates to some of the Council's goals. Um, you know, affordable housing is is one of your goals for this year. Um, Housing Alliance has been working hard on that topic for a number of years. Uh, most recently, we passed historic preservation incentives with this particular property listed as a locally historic property. So that's certainly relevant. Um, and last fall, the town uh, conducted a Dunstan revitalization effort and study, uh, which very much included this area of the community, and, and, and this is within the boundaries of that that revitalization study and, and recommendations. Um, in terms of in terms of process, this is proposed to be a contract zone because of um, the uniqueness of the project and, and really a contract zone would work best to kind of allow for some of the, the zoning implications that are that are needed for this type of a project. Um, it's a it's a deliberate and lengthy process, um, certainly, um, and it's designed that way. And it starts this evening with a joint meeting um, of the town council and planning board. And um, after um, a quick introduction, the applicant will go through their presentation. Um, and um, by the end of the, the discussion, um, there's, there is an action expected of the council, and that is to, um, to give guidance to the applicant as to how to proceed. Um, you can recommend that they withdraw the project because there isn't support for the project. That's one step you could take. Um, another step would be to uh, encourage them to continue um, as proposed or with some modifications that you may identify this evening in your discussions. Or you can encourage them to revise their application if you think it needs some revisions and then you can kind of reconduct this, this joint meeting and uh, with a more complete application or additional application materials. So the council has, and with input from the planning board, um, has that authority and, and you really want to be giving good guidance to the applicant because of the length of the process and the number of meetings that, that occur in the coming months. So after this evening, if you do give them the kind of the green light and, and some encouragement, um, it goes to the planning board. The planning board conducts um, really a preliminary site plan review. Um, that could take one meeting, it could take multiple meetings, and they need to issue a preliminary approval um, before it comes back to you as the council, and then you would conduct your kind of more routine zoning amendment process, consist but focus on this contract zone. You'd have a first reading, you'd have a public hearing, and then a second reading, and then the, the final step would be final site plan review, development review by the planning board, and then they would move forward with construction if all that goes well. Um, so that really kind of lays out the process, um, and there's, for the benefit of the public, there's public hearings um, throughout that process, both this evening, there should be time for public hearing. The planning board, through their preliminary review, includes a public hearing, and the council would also have a public hearing in, in your step in the process later on. Um, so that really kind of lays out the, the, the timeline for the next coming months. Um, so. With that, I think the next step would be to have the applicant kind of go over their uh, proposal to you and um, and then go from there. Uh, good evening, uh, Chair uh, Holbrook uh, and council members and Chair Fellow as fellows and planning board members. Uh, my name is Dana Totman and I'm the CEO of Avesta Housing. And we're excited to make this presentation tonight and, and excited to be working on this development. We haven't done a development before in Scarborough, so I'm going to provide some quick background on our organization, um, and then our team will uh, present uh, this application. Uh, with me tonight are Seth Parker and Kyle Ambler from uh, Avesta Housing, uh, Dan Riley from uh, our site engineer from Sebago Techniques, and Maggie Stanley and Rick Caduti, the architects. Uh, Avesta Housing was founded in 1972 um, when two community action agencies came together and created an organization to deal with affordable housing in southern Maine. Uh, since then, 
um, we've created a number of developments, um, and but none in um, Scarborough, to my knowledge. Uh, we've grown over the years. Today, we have about 2,000 apartments in about 75 developments, uh, primarily in southern Maine, uh, a few scattered um, in northern and central Maine, and a few in New Hampshire. Uh, these 75 developments serve many different populations, seniors, workforce, some special needs populations. Uh, and we've worked closely with the communities in each case when these have been developed. Uh, in addition to our affordable rental housing, we also have an assisted living facility in Gorham, and we have a home ownership center in um, uh, our offices in Portland. I want to just highlight um, some of the activity we've done all around Scarborough, and um, I think that helps um, explain who we are. Uh, in Gorham, we have four existing affordable housing developments. We have a fifth one that will start construction this summer. Uh, most of those are adjacent to the USM campus. In South Portland, um, we had four <coughs> phases that were involved in, in the redevelopment of the main youth center. Uh, some of that was historic preservation, the old cottages um, on that campus. Uh, in Saco, we have four affordable housing developments. Um, the newest one is just over the Scarborough Saco line. That's um, Cascade Brooks that we did in partnership with Elliot uh, Chamberlain. Um, in, uh, in, and I want to mention a little bit about historic rehab. Uh, we have done probably 11 uh, historic rehab developments. We've done old schools, we've done old houses, we've done old institutions. And um, uh, sometimes these serve senior households, sometimes they serve families. Um, we did an, two old schools in Kennebunk uh, in the last few years. One is for families, one is for elderly. We recently did an old school in, uh, in, in Biddeford. Um, last year we did uh, an old school in, in Westbrook that was in family housing. So we, historic rehabilitation is important to us. We like to preserve uh, buildings that really contribute to a, a town or city's character. Um, and so that's kind of what brings us here tonight. We are um, looking at the old Southgate farm. Um, we think it's a, a, a <coughs> precious building, a, a, a precious site, and um, one that frankly is in danger uh, of being preserved because it is in, in some pretty significant disrepair. So this development for us really is an opportunity to um, <coughs> fulfill three objectives, uh, two objectives and a third one that I think match up well with yours. Um, we do do affordable housing. Uh, we have about 3,000 people on our wait list looking for affordable housing, and we'll have about 300 openings this coming year. I can't begin to tell you, uh, <coughs> frankly, how, how desperate the affordable housing challenge really is, and it doesn't really matter if you're um, young or older or, or retired. Um, there are just long waiting lists and very <coughs> few affordable options to um, people that need them. So um, this would help with that. Um, it also helps preserve this, this farm, and as I say, we love to do housing, uh, we love to preserve old buildings. They're difficult, but we like doing difficult projects. Um, and thirdly, we like <coughs> to sometimes provide a little uh, economic boost uh, to an area. Certainly the construction alone of our developments um, create a lot of jobs and opportunity for local folks. But to get a little bit more momentum in that Dunstan um, neighborhood and, and bring some uh, additional life to it, uh, we think this development would be uh, a sort of an economic <coughs> boost for the area. So we, we like um, the opportunity in front of us. We think it's, it's a project that would um, serve the community well and really fulfill some important needs. So I'll turn it over to Dan Riley, who will um, um, uh, go from, from here and tell a little bit more about, about our plans. Thank you. Um, good evening. My name is Dan Riley. I'm an engineer with Sebago Technics, and we're the, uh, the site design, landscape architect, and surveyors for the project. Um, what I'd like to do tonight, or at, for at the beginning here, is to talk a little bit about the site, the overall concept for, for the site plan, um, and then have the architect talk about the building architecture and wrap up then with some of the the items that the unique characteristics of this site um, require 
some relief through a contract zone with. Um, we do have our, our boards here, but we've, we've got everything that's on the boards um, on, on display here to make it a little easier to see. Uh, the project site is the Southgate House property. Um, it's a, at 577 Route 1. It's shown as tax map 34 on lot 37. Um, it's a three-acre site, um, as you see on, on the overhead there. Phillips Brook forms the boundary of what we're calling the, the, uh, the north end of the property. Um, it fronts with about a little over 200 feet of frontage on Route 1, and it's located in between the former S. Brooks Nursery and an antique dealership, or antique dealer building. Um, the predominant uh, feature of the site is the Southgate House. Uh, it's a farmhouse that was built somewhere between uh, 1798 and 1805. Um, with its attached extension. Um, there are two um, significant, uh, historically significant barns that were constructed about the same era behind the building um, that will be preserved and incorporated into the site. The building is located in the town and village center fringe zone. Um, it is right on the edge, uh, on, the, on the graphic that you see there, the property to the south, the, uh, the antique dealership is in the town and village centers district. And we're about, to give some scale, we're about 800 feet from um, excuse me, from Payne Road and about 1,200 feet from the intersection of Broad Turn Road on Route 1. So the concept for the development is shown in the rendering there on the screen. And uh, the important components are there is, um, first is the, the preservation and conversion of the Southgate Farmhouse, which is the building closest to Route 1 highlighted in white. Um, again, constructed in the early 1800s, it's currently uh, utilized as seven apartment units. Uh, units. That building will be renovated and preserved um, to, and converted into eight, uh, eight one-bedroom affordable housing units. The front porch on the building that you see in brown there may be retained. Um, it's not part of the original 1800s construction and was, was added later, um, and that comes into play a little bit on one of the contract zone provisions. Behind the site, the two, the two smaller white buildings there labeled as barns are uh, two of the barns that are slated to be preserved as part of the project, one of which may be connected to the building and reused as part of the, of the proposed facility. And behind it, um, the larger building that you see behind it with, that's labeled as new building construction is the, the central portion of the project. It's a, it's a three and three story in the front, four story in the rear um, building housing 42 units that are currently broken out as um, eight efficiency units, 29 one bedroom units, and five two bedroom units. Um, and as I said, with the conversion of the existing house from seven to eight units, it will be a total of uh, 50 affordable housing units on the site. So as part of the project, as, uh, as uh, Dana did allude to, that it, we're planning to maintain and renovate the farmhouse and its extension in its current condition and restore it to its, its uh, appearance from the uh, early 1800s. Um, the proposal is to preserve and relocate slightly the barn immediately behind it. Um, in order to reuse that barn uh, for use of the community, a foundation has to be constructed and as part of the project, we would relocate that building somewhat towards, towards the front of the site. And the third barn in the rear would be preserved on site, but due to its condition and the cost of renovation, it's likely not to be incorporated into the project, but it would be preserved and maintained in place for its historic importance. Uh, there are two um, other 20th century structures, uh, outbuildings that are sort of in the middle of the site where the parking lot is proposed that are, are, are um, likely to be, will be removed as part of the project. Um, as we'll get into with the, the building architecture and with some of the provisions of the contract zone, um, some of the constraints on the site to preserve that building really dictate the placement of the new structure. Um, there is a shoreland zone associated with Phillips Brook that extends 250 feet up onto the property from the edge of the wetlands there, and the majority of that building and the, and the end of the parking lot at the north end of the site is within that. We've designed the facility and the site to respond to that. Uh, we're meeting the requirements of the shoreland zone in that area. But those constraints in constructing the new facility while preserving the existing buildings that are in the middle of the site um, dictate the site layout and really dictate uh, a number of the provisions that we're looking for uh, through the contract zone. The remainder of the, of the site development that we've developed on the plan you see there is um, surface parking for the residents. Um, Currently, uh, we're proposing 50 parking spaces in the area that's marked in gray on the site. Uh, it's alongside the building where some of the existing uh, parking is, is located today. Um, that's one item that we'll be talking about in the contract zone. The, the underlying zoning requires 55 spaces. We're currently showing 50 or one per unit. 
um, based on information that Avesta has from their other projects of the actual parking demand of their facilities. Um, and there may be some space remaining uh, within the constraints of the shoreland zone to expand that somewhat to get very close to what the requirements are. Um, the other features of the site development really are, the, are landscaping around each of the buildings. There'll be pedestrian connections and sidewalks throughout the facility and connecting into the sidewalks along Route 1. And some storm, a stormwater management facility, really a grass um, under drain soil filter at the rear of the building to address the stormwater um, that's going to be generated from the project. Um, we will require a, a permit from uh, the Maine Department of Environmental Protection as part of the planning board process. Um, through here. So I, I, we've provided a few pictures of the, of the site um, it, as it stands historically and what it looks like today to give a little bit of, t of context. Um, this is a picture of the building sort of from the southwest um, of the building around the time of its construction in the early 1800s. The photograph isn't dated. Some pictures of the building as it looks today, looking ahead from Route 1 or, and looking slightly from the east across uh, <coughs> from Route 1, looking back at the, the farmhouse that will be preserved. Um, the existing brick structure was the original, as you saw in the historic photos, the, the existing original facade of the building. And um, there's evaluations being done now as to whether the, the porch that was added later will be retained as part of the project or removed. Again, some other, a couple other shots again from Looking from the south and, and west, um, this side of the building, you can see the, the existing farmhouse with its extension to the rear, and then the two barns that you see in the lower photo are uh, the barn on the, on the right is slated to be uh, supported by a new foundation and relocated and connected to the new building, uh, potentially for use as community space or at a minimum preserved. And the, the barn to the left um, will remain in its existing location and, and simply pr be preserved for uh, preservation reasons but not reused. Excuse me. Sorry, I've jumped past the. Uh, so, with with the the after looking sort of at the site and the layout of the the project, I thought we would uh, turn it over to the architects uh, from Gatuti Thomas Architects to talk a little bit about the proposed structure and the architecture of the building. Hi, um, Maggie Stanley from Gatuti Thomas Architects. Dan kind of struck on the historic a aspect already of the main buildings here. Oh, okay. There I am. Um, and I just want to talk about the new construction in the back. Because of the historic nature of this project, the primary focus from the street and from the view that the National Park Service will be concerned with is the preservation of the main building. Um, given that fact, the our new construction can't overpower and take away from that grandeur of the historic nature of the building. So we've used the size of the site and the, and the, um, and the slope that the site provides to try to make that our new construction blend as well as it can with a historic building and take up as little of the um, emphasis from the street view and the side view of uh, of the main building. In this rendering here, you can see that although it's a three-story building, we've incorporated uh, dormers for the top story, which would be the efficiency apartments that are set back from the main, from the front facade. And that will help um, keep the height of the building down and the overall massing at a minimal. Um, in the back, and here's a closer view of it. In the, the top ridge line of that is consistent through, and so the back of the building we get four stories, but the ridge line stays the same, so you don't see an increase in height, um, and that is moving further away from the street. So as your perspective f from a distance, it becomes even less noticeable. Um, the overall massing of the building itself is to fit with the historic nature of the barns. It becomes it starts itself with a, the barns with like a, sh a shed off to the side there where the entrance are. So it's, it's a very uh, historic vernacular there that will blend with the rest of the property as being uh, you know, farm farmhouse um, with the back buildings as a barn structure. There may be some modern elements 
as we work on the entrances, you can start to see we suggest that, but that will be worked out when we work with the community space of the existing barn and the, the new entrances there, all in keeping with the historic, um, complement, complementing the historic nature. And I just show you here the elevation straight on. You can see on the top elevation there, that's the east, it's the east elevation. So you can see that grade change from the front of the building to the back of it where you keep, you have the two dormers at the top where the efficiencies would be and you keep the same ridge line all the way through but gaining that extra story for the extra apartments needed to suffice here. And the front elevation, you can see how the, the, the lower elevation, you'll see the barn next to it. The existing barn is a small building on the left and the shape of the building itself. Although straight on it does look much larger, when you look at the renderings, you can see how it actually doesn't, it doesn't over, overtake the historic nature. Um, and that's kind of the gist of where we are right now for architectural, for the massing of the, of the building. So. So the, last, um, the last item I wanted to cover before we, um, we <laughs> open it up for questions is to talk a little bit about um, the contract zone provisions and what some of the requirements are due to the, um, due to the, to the uh, unique characteristic of the site. Sorry, I put my notes down. I don't want to make sure I don't, I, we don't miss anything. Um, so the, in, in the contract zone application, we did talk about uh, a number of provisions that were seeking uh, adjustments to the underlying zoning to accommodate the features of the site. And it's really driven by the historic preservation the location of the existing building sort of dictate the location of where the new building needs to be relocated. Its scale and mass is really necessary to keep the uh, affordable cost of the project down and meet the state, state guidelines. And so you'll see as you read through the application and, and as we talk about this, the provisions are generally uh, related around the density of the project, number of units allowed, and then the, some related to the scale of the building and parking that's associated with it. So the provisions that are outlined and requested, first it relates to the use. Uh, the TVC3 zone allows multiplex units but limits their, their size to 12 units in a, in a single building. This project, as we said, pr uh, proposes a 42 unit building. Uh, these are 100% affordable units. Uh, they are smaller than your typical market rate units and can never be converted to market rate units. Um, the second item related to the use of the property is the setbacks. Uh, the underlying zoning has, requires a minimum of 25 foot setback from, the, from Route 1 and a maximum of 75 feet. The existing farmhouse building's uh, porch is about 77 feet, so that building is non-conforming from that standpoint. The, the porch may be removed to restore the historic facade of the building, which will again, which will increase that non-conformity of the existing building. And then simply due to the location of that building and the need to preserve the existing structures, the new building will clearly be set back uh, beyond the maximum setback. So we're looking for some adjustment to the zoning to allow that to occur. The second uh, item uh, for the contract zone relates to the residential density. Uh, the project is about three acres in site. Uh, when we apply the affordable housing provisions of the ordinance and the historic preservation credits, uh, doing that net residential calculation results in 24.4, rounded down to 24 units, would be allowed under the current zoning. Uh, due to the size of the project and applying the same affordable housing provisions allowed in the ordinance, the proposed building um, would result in 30 units from a density calculation standpoint. So we're looking for adjustment in the contract zone to go from essentially 24 and a half units allowed to 29 and a third units allowed. So about six units of additional density is what we're asking for. Um, a second item of the zoning relates to the building coverage. Uh, the, the zoning allows for multiplex buildings with up to 10,000 square feet of footprint space on the property uh, in it for an individual building, excuse me. The current building as it's shown and, and presented in the application is about 9,830 square feet. So the new proposed building meets the requirements. However, um, we are proposing and wish to connect that building to the existing barn. So when you add the footprint of the mm -hmm. barn to the footprint of the new building, we are more than 10,000 square feet, but we're less than 12,000 square feet, which is another limit that's allowed for other uses in that zone. So we'll be requesting some additional um, building footprint, um, understanding that it's due to the fact that we're connecting to the existing structure. 
the other item relates to building height. Uh, and as of in the application, we describe this, but it's not clear that whether we need relief in the contract zone, we need interpretation from the uh, code enforcement officer on this. The building height requirements in the zone allow for three stories or 45 feet of height. And the ordinance defines that height at the front of the building. So project as it's presented today, if the elevation facing Route 1 is considered the front of the building, we meet that height requirement. As Maggie pointed out, and you can see in the elevations that the, and probably more effectively in the, um, in the, the, the site concept, the building is segmented. The, the forward portion of the building is three stories tall from grade and with a, with a building height that meets the requirements and the, the number of zone, excuse me, floors allowed by the zoning. The building steps down a level, so there's a fourth floor added to the rear of the site, but that steps down below the parking lot grade and steps back away from towards the sideline, <laughs> sort of mimicking the pattern of the existing barns on the property and, and hiding that fourth floor. So measured at the rear of the building or on the east elevation, we'll be four stories tall, but it, it appears that we are still gonna meet the height requirements of the ordinance. So depending on how the code enforcement interprets the front of the building, the final contract zone may request an additional fourth story um, if, if this is considered the front of the building. Um, and then finally, the, the other provisions of the contract zone, again, are related to the parking ratios and required parking on the site. Uh, based on the mix of units and the number proposed under the underlying zoning, uh, 55 parking spaces are required. The plan that you see tonight shows 50 parking spaces. Um, it is possible that um, we can add uh, another three spaces uh, in, that, in that end of the site that's within the shoreland zone and still remain within the limitations of the shoreland zone. Uh, but we have to work through some of the final design of the property. Uh, the shoreland zone portion, we're restricted to impervious area of 20% of that area. And we are within that um, and we'll stay within that. And, but we have some leeway that we may be able to add some additional parking spaces. So, but we are including in the contract zone um, a request to reduce the parking ratio for the project to one, um, one space per unit, regardless of the unit size. Um, Avesta, as we go through the planning board process, Avesta has information from their other developments that uh, supports the fact that their population generally does not have as many vehicles as, as a typical underlying um, zoning might require. And then finally, uh, the final provision that we discuss in the application and, and maybe more of a planning board discussion rather than a contract zone provision is the location of the parking. Um, the design guidelines for the TVC3 zone um, encourage parking to be located to the side and rear of buildings, particularly when those buildings are set back from away from Route 1. Um, the zoning does allow parking across the front of buildings in that front setback, a single row, which we are opting not to do because of the historic nature of the building. But we are going to be requesting that the parking be allowed to be constructed um, as it's shown today, where the, the parking is forward of the building line, but to the side. It doesn't fit neatly into the design guidelines that are in the ordinance, um, but that, that's something we'll be discussing with the, uh, with the planning board going forward. But in order to meet those parking requirements, um, while preserving the existing buildings and the appearance of those buildings from the street and reacting to the, uh, to the shoreland zone really necessitates that construction, which also mimics the, maintains some of the parking that's there today. Um, so with that, that sort of summarizes where we are with the application and the provisions we'll be looking for in the contract zone, and um, we're certainly all here to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Um, so we need, we need public comment, correct? So before we dive into um, our, our conversation, it is a public hearing, so is there anybody that wishes to speak from the public on this item? All right. And seeing none, I'll close the public comment. So, questions? Mm. Anybody have any questions? Oh, no, and it is a joint. It's joint. <laughs> I guess I'll start on behalf of the planning board. Um, Question to the applicant, uh, you made a couple of references to the National Park Service and that process and historic preservation. Could you give us a little background on where where the site stands with regard to that process? Do, are you <laughs> part one approval or is that in process and uh, generally where that stands? And what the anticipated timing is? Um, you go to the mic, sorry. My name is Rick Caduti, Caduti Thomas Architects. The Part One process is in is is in the process of 
application finished and being submitted, I think there's a 30-day review period before we actually get the answer back. But we're, we have a historic consultant from Massachusetts who's working on it. She's assured us that the Part 1 will be coming. And as part of the Part 1, everything that we've done and everything that we're sort of questioning about the site is being reviewed by her. And we haven't made any assumptions without her involvement and her agreement as to how we're approaching it. We had quite a bit of discussion about the um, viability of the two barns, the two barns that we're saving. Um, they're really not, um, they're, they, anybody would say that you would be better off taking them down and rebuilding them, but she wants them to be reconstructed with the materials that are there so long as it's not rotten. So we've incorporated that into the into the uh, part one approval process. The question about the front of the uh, existing house and the uh, screen and porch or the open porch with the, with the enclosed glass is a question of whether or not we can leave that or take it down. Um, and that depends on how the Park Service determines the period of most significance. Um, prior to when that was added or after. I think we're all of the opinion that we'd like to take it down because we, as you, what we really like is that image that we saw, saw before. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a handsome building either way, but we think it's more handsome with the, with the uh, front piece off. So the pieces that we know we have to deal with are um, the house and the surround, the porch surround, the two barns, the other two pieces we're taking off are, are disappearing. And um, we have, uh, with what we do new, we have to reflect um, a character that's um, not necessarily mimicking what was there before, but reflecting um, how something today might be built with respect to what was built before and how we can combine our materials and our shapes. And that's what we've tried to do. So that's what we are. Mm-hmm, absolutely. Um, there's reference to the design standards and the fact that we generally do like to see the, the parking work to the back. And um, I think we also tend to like to see actually more massing toward the street. And I understand the issue with the, the historic process, but could you maybe elaborate a little bit? You know, I don't want to belabor it, but maybe elaborate a little bit on what's driving that from the historic Perspective. I understand that you need to have sort of the new structure needs to be complementary and not overwhelm it. But how much of a driver is that? It's it's a significant driver, but there's several things that drive it. Um, one is is that uh, if we put the new building next to the existing house, um, the scale and the mass and the relationship of that building, which we're calling the barn, so to speak. Uh, it would be inconsistent with the way farmhouses usually are presented to the street, house, connector, barn. And so we're trying to respect that aspect of it and that we're trying to respect the space around the existing house um, that sets that building almost mm -hmm. up on a pedestal. If we put our building next to it, it's going to sort of push down on that, on our existing building. So we felt that um, setting the building behind was appropriate from maintaining the grandeur of the existing house and also respecting the relationship of the barn to the house in a traditional sense. And then um, the next thing we had to do is we felt that the scale uh, of the barn needed to be very carefully sized appropriately as, it, as one would imagine a barn might be uh, 100 years old in relation to its house. And we were very careful not to oversize the building or to let the scale of the building or the massing of the building get to a point where we were, where it was sort of dominating the house. So we've kept the height of the building. Um, I think it's all, the height of the building is almost, the height at the ridge of the new building is almost the same height as the, of the, of the hipped roof on the main house. And from the street, 
by perspective, you can't even really see the building behind it. If you go off to the side, you can. Actually, if you go off to the east side, you can. If you go off to the west side, you can. Um, so w we were very careful to integrate our new building with the old barn um, as it steps up and with the house and not feeling as though behind, you know, behind this house that's so nice there's a big building looming over it. And I don't think we have any of that. And I, I hope that our photographs show that. Uh, did I answer? Yes. We're, we're already, I, to answer your, uh, the part two um, comes in two parts, really. And we've already identified all the significant pieces that we know that we have to address as part of the part two. Uh, we don't have all the answers, but that's already in, are sort of already in process. And, and those are all not ifs, they're all whens and hows. Oh. <laughs> um, how, does anybody have any, any questions? At this? Yeah, I was wondering what the range of size of the units are, square footage of the individual units. 350 to approximately 712. 350 to 712? Yeah, so one, it's a, it's a 350 is a studio, and the 712 is a two bedroom. Just one. Seven, the 712 is two bedroom. Um, so I, I apologize if this is a kind of a trivial question. So. Um, while it's low income, is there, for Vesta, is there uh, age eligibility requirements that you, you know, is it open to anybody who has an income restriction or income? Uh, it would be open to any age, I think must be at least 18, but, um, but no upper limit. Yep. And the, the income uh, range that we're targeting uh, I believe is about 27,000 to around 43,000, which is um, how the uh, housing tax credit targeting works. Did I get that right, Kyle? 27 Good. to 43. Thank 000. you. Sure. Could you talk a little bit about um, the, on that thought of you know how how much? Could you talk a little bit about the you know, the Vesta and its kind of dynamic of um, how that plays with main state housing and, and, and you know how you can arrive to certain rents and, and certain thresholds and um, how, how that some of that works. Um, yes, I, I can, and I'll do my best to not get into some um, <laughs> um, bureaucratic language here because it's it's uh, the, the regulators um, have a fierce effect on what it is we try to do. Uh, the Main State Housing Authority distributes tax credits each year to about uh, five, six, or seven developments from around the state that compete. And it's quite competitive. And to compete, you, you need to commit to having the tar the, um, um, all of the units have to serve people at 60% or less of the median income. And then you get some extra points depending on if you have some 50% um, people at 50% of median income. So we have the two layers of, of income targeting in there to basically help us get enough points to compete. And as I want to emphasize, it's very competitive. Every developer knows what they're going to have to do and every little point counts. So ultimately, uh, they figure out how much rental income do you need to pay for your expenses. And it has to be within the IRS guidelines, which say dictate the 60 and 50 percent income, uh, incomes. Does that help? Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing, too, is I uh, um, wanted to ask just a question around, um, we, we've talked about in other projects, the scoring, and you know where where you feel that this project might score comparable to other other projects within the state housing. Um, we think this is competitive. Um, uh, we we think there are a number of factors that um, uh, affect our score. The overall cost per unit per, per apartment is an important. Um, number we want to achieve, 
and to achieve that number, that's how we sort of arrived. That's one of the things that drove the, the size of this, um, that and the need to spread all of our infrastructure costs out as many units as possible. So um, the cost per unit is a key factor. Having planning board approval um, and having, is it the 30 or the 45 day appeal period, appeal period exhausted um, <laughs> at the time we apply is worth, I think, 10 points. Um, being close to certain services um, like a store or a, a, a gas station or a church or, or things, you get so many points for that. This is a good site, and it is because mm -hmm. of the um, complementary businesses um, at Dunstan Corner, it scores, scores well. Uh, the, let me think what else. Um, our commitment to preserve it for a long period of time. But planning board and approval and cost and the proximity to services are really what usually distinguish the winners from the losers, if, mm -hmm. if you will. It's, those are the kind of the, the key items. And so we've scored this based upon what we assume Main State Housing Authority's scoring criteria is going to be. Um, they have told us it will be the same as it was last year, so we think we know, but it's not official. And so that's our plan. The, the applications are due in late September. And so this is on a fairly tight um, time frame, but it's a project we're really excited about. And so we've invested um, in this in a, in a big way um, because we, we think it's a worthy project. Just if I could on that point, uh, Mr. Wood asked me the setup for tonight, and really the timing of this has everything to do with what Dana just described, needing to have planning board approval and the appeal period exhausted before earlier mid-September. Dan laid out the process, and they'll have to push very hard, given some of the additional historic preservation hurdles that, they, that they'll have before them, to get through that process and have a fighting chance of making application in September. So to accommodate that, those needs of the schedule, we've kind of shoehorned this into this meeting agenda. So I apologize for any convenience <laughs> that may have caused members of the planning board or council, but that's really why it has happened uh, the way it has. Mm -hmm. I, I just have a quick question, uh, and if I heard you correctly, these will never go to market? rate, so to speak, they will always stay as affordable housing, is that correct? In, in, yes, we need to commit to Maine State Housing Authority that they'll be affordable for 99 years. Okay. I can't guarantee the hundreds, right. but I'll, I'll... But it's I'll, not like some of the HUD, HUD deals it's that not it's the 25 or, or whatever. 20 or whatever. Yeah, it's yeah. 99 years is okay. the um, um, commitment we make to okay. these, which is um, a long time. Yeah. <laughs> I can't think of a, a more uh, interesting property in the Dunstan area to, uh, to see a, a transformation such as this. Uh, you haven't spoken about preservation of the landscape, in, in, uh, in particular the mature trees on the site. Is, is that something you've looked at at all at this point? I'll turn it over to one of the um, technical experts here. It's certainly an, it's important, so we'll do everything we can. Uh, yes. I, I, uh, I alluded to the fact that it's not just the building, it's the building and the site that um, will be evaluated by the Park Service. And, and I explained all the reasons why we located the building the way we did. And the landscape um, is important because it sets a stage for the building. So we've attempted to reflect that, um, and it was in a, in a way to address, I can't remember your name, but you want to know why we weren't putting a building up front. We didn't put the building up front because, as a landscape element, it would compete with the building and the traditional, original landscape of the site. So we've, we've tried to locate the building in a way that, from all views of the existing house and of the barns, there's a quality that, in the view, that is, there, that is going to be there that was there, and that the trees... Um, the only trees that we have to take down are the trees that are in trouble, uh, uh, except for out at the back of the building 
on the four story there's probably I don't know seven or eight trees or ten trees that we might have to take down there, but we don't think that that's really a significant impact on the overall character of the landscape so um, the landscape as we see it is uh, the large majestic trees with a lawn uh, a lawn surrounding the building, and that's what we're attempting to maintaining and and uh, support. Any other questions, or we can go on to the how we feel round if we'd like. <laughs> um, so, can, what, yeah, Bill. Can we get a clarification, perhaps, from the town manager as to the uh, uh, order itself? And the it appears there were three options. Yes, we laid out, this is actually lifted directly out of the zoning ordinance. Uh, so we've list, lifted the three options that are available to the town council this evening, not wanting to presuppose what you might do. We've laid them all out there for you, so you'll, uh, you'll have to select one of them. Um, that, does that help with the question? Uh, can you explain what the three, three options represent? I could, but I think Dan Baker could explain it much better. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> Boy, that was good. Um, yeah, the, the council suggests the ordinance suggests the council shall by a vote advise the applicant to number one to withdraw the request of, of draw the request for contract zoning. That's one option. Number two is to continue to process the request for contract zoning with or without modifications suggested by the council. Say this evening you have modifications you'd suggest. You could, you, should, you could include those. Or three, to revise and resubmit the application for contract zoning under that particular section of the ordinance. Um, so that, that option would suggest that we think that the submission isn't complete or it needs some additional material and then you'd have this kind of meeting again and then reconsider it. So. Um, one is to advise that we're not in support. One says uh, move forward and um, and good luck. And three is come back with a, an updated application and we'll think about it again. Thank you. <coughs> so um, that would be a motion for the first and the second to one of the three options. So um, anybody <coughs> have any other? Questions about the process of how how we move forward. Mm -hmm. okay. um, anybody want to? I have lots of great feelings and thoughts that I want to <laughs> share, but um, does so anybody else? Well, I have a procedural question. So um, I am in favor of option number two. The question is whether it's with or without modifications. And procedurally, I want to make sure I do the right one. I'm in favor of this continuing forward. And if I understand it correctly, it would be with modifications as presented by the applicant. Correct. Like a, there's like a part of the sentence that's missing, and it's which modification it says the applicant has submitted in this in this proposal, or is it modifications that we have to come up with and suggest? It's the latter. It's modifications you would suggest that they consider. Okay. So I would move approval that we um, allow, and I don't have to have it in front of me, but um, move approval that we would uh, continue the process for request for contract zoning without modifications. I would second that. And so now we can have discussion. So, um, you know, actually, um, <coughs> I think you hold that for, for one second before we, we get on the debate of, of whether to move it. Um, I did just wanted to hear no, <laughs> uh, if there was any additional feedback from the planning board about any suggestions about modifications or if there's anything that, you know, you erroneously kind of stood out to you or. Yeah, nothing stands out to me as far as uh, what your role might be as far as how it fits in the contract zone uh, ordinance. Uh, I'm eager to dive into the site plan details, you know, mm -hmm. um, but I think that's that's after right. you folks uh, wish, uh, you know, allow us to see it another day. Similarly, I, <coughs> excuse me, I don't see anything that, would, that I would see as a threshold issue and there will surely be modifications within the context of the planning board's review if that goes forward typically are but I I think it's got a lot of promise and <clears throat> when I first heard about this I was pretty excited because 
I think it solves a lot of issues we have in town. And um, then when I heard the presentation, I was you know, more pleased. So um, I think we should do everything we can to make this work. <laughs> That's my come to. Well, thank you very much for you. for your in input and feedback. Um, so now I'm going to draw back into our first in our second on on the on the which is my first contract zone that I had to run. So bear with me. Uh, so discussion. Huh? So um, I believe this actually achieves um, even with the, with the modifications that they're requesting achieves many objectives. Um, not only affordable housing, but the bigger picture is really long-range and vision planning regarding the Dunstan redevelopment, what I would call Dunstan redevelopment, and this could be the catalyst based upon what I'm seeing. And I do, you know, uh, believe that the planning board will delve uh, eagerly into all of the details and make a proper recommendation and proposal for us. So uh, I'm very happy with what I've heard and seen and hope this moves forward. Uh, I was very impressed by the professionalism of the presentation and the materials that were submitted. Uh, uh, I particularly liked the, uh, the way in which you were attempting to integrate uh, a new structure <coughs> visually from the street, from the public area of the street, <coughs> to uh, disguise a 42 unit building. Uh, I think that's, uh, that's an excellent idea. Uh, the historic preservation to me is is wonderful, and and second only to getting affordable housing. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know which one I'd be more excited about, but they're both uh, these are terrific. So I would uh, strongly support <coughs> the motion. Right. Uh, I also support this motion uh, as a real estate <laughs> professional. I know of the lack of affordable housing in this area, and particularly in Scarborough. So I'm I'm thrilled that we will be creating that many units of affordable housing for folks in Scarborough. And I also believe that uh, communities benefit from great diversity. Um, so bringing in this more diverse population can only be good for Scarborough. And? I think it's a wonderful project. Uh, I, I do have a couple of concerns. I don't think you have nearly as many parking spaces as you would and mm -hmm. here's 50 units and 50 units. <coughs> I don't think that's really uh, And also, I'm a little bit concerned about the entrance and exit. It's all off to Route 1. Um, looks like it could be kind of hairy, especially in the rush hour in the morning or the afternoon. It's all right if you go and if you take a right, you can take a left. But uh, I like the design. I like the fact that it's very, very low impact on the school system. It's a impact at all. Good luck with it. <laughs> 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 you have anything you want to add? I just echo what my colleague has already said. So it may work. Thank you. Um, so well, I'll just chime in. Um, I can't imagine why I would support this conservation <laughs> effort or an affordable effort. Um, so I, I do just want to comment about um, the absolutely outstanding and, and thorough job. Not not that I've had um, the opportunity to deal with a ton of contract zones, but but certainly this is a very detailed and well well thought out and well laid um, plan and proposal. Um, and just for the benefit of the folks at home, um, some of the, the interesting, more interesting notes about this property is um, it does certainly have, um, you know, it's on our historic, designate, you know, this recently designated historic building list. Uh, it's also a um, connection to the King family, which is, um, you know, deep, deeply rooted in here in Maine history. Um, and sometimes we call it the Southgate House. It's also like the Titan King. Um, and, and the one other interesting, um, it, I, I might want to point out because I didn't, the only thing I didn't see in this very thorough review was the meteor that sits um, in the front of that property just off to the, to the side was the antique place. Um, so it, it just, as a key feature, that, 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 that's important. Not every day we have a boulder that's actually a meteor from outer space. Um, 
Evening. We have no old business at this time. So, new business is order number 15 032, which is act on the request from the town manager to proceed with the recommendations brought forward to the town council on the tax acquired property pursuant to the policy for disposition of tax acquired property. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this is the first time I've gone through this process, so bear with me. Uh, I have prepared a memorandum, and uh, the, the order is uh, kind of curiously devoid of detail, but I assure you my memo would be part of the official minute, so they'll, this will follow uh, as will uh, the spreadsheet that it, it relates to. Um, following the policy the council crea created and most recently updated, uh, I have solicited input from the required departments uh, and various boards and commissions, and um, to my surprise, Dan Bacon was the only one that provided substantive comment uh, <laughs> of all those groups. Um, and I, I want to flag that because he's made recommendations for pres preservation or to keep at least parts of two certain properties, and I've made recommendations contrary to his suggestion. Uh, he and I have talked about it. It's not a deal breaker, but I just wanted to make that aware uh, to the council. So if you bear with me, I think it's, uh, I'll just run down through my list of recommendations. And this is based on the 26 properties that we currently have in this category of tax acquired property. Worth noting for the public, perhaps, some of them date from 1957. So this is not, uh, these aren't all recent occurrences. This is a, a backlog, um, and we're trying to clean it up. So I'm going to reference the numbers on the spreadsheet rather than parcel ID numbers. Uh, so I, sit, I recommend that for parcels 1, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12, they be retained for as town property. Essentially, all of the properties in that category, um, in my estimation, have very limited monetary value, are not developable, uh, but actually have high natural resource value. So I think they're good things for us to keep. For parcels 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 13, 14, and 15, uh, based on staff input, we see no purpose to hold on to these as public property. And I propose that we go through an open competitive process to sell those properties. Uh, as a footnote, I suspect because most, if not all of them, are undevelopable in their own right, they don't have terrible, great market value, we'll make extra effort to communicate with the butters as they may well be the most interested parties to uh, pick up those, uh, those parcels. Uh, for parcel 16, I, I have been successful in making initial contract, contact with the prior owner who's interested in an installment sales contract, so I will be pursuing those conversations and expect we'll come to terms. Uh, for parcels 18 and 20, uh, both of these are recent foreclosures. Um, we have been unsuccessful, though we'll continue to try um, to even speak to prior owners, and for that reason I recommend that we uh, pursue uh, the procedure under Article 4. Uh, essentially that is, um, a 90-day kind of one-time redemption period. Mm -hmm. And should that be successful, because I honestly have not been able to contact prior owners, um, we would move for public sale. For parcels 17, 19, and 21, um, 
in these cases, prior owners have been very actively engaged with my office. In fact, one of them made an appearance before the council last fall, uh, expressing interest in reacquiring the property. In these three cases, they are not primary residences, so they're not candidates for the sales installment approach, uh, but they are candidates for the one-time redemption approach, and that's what I propose we do for those three parcels. <coughs> Incidentally, two of those three are two of the parcels Dan Bacon mentioned has some um, natural resource value as it relates to Red Brook and that watershed. Moving along, parcel 25, um, that was under contract. Unfortunately, the prior owner uh, failed to meet all the terms of the contract. We've fallen out. I propose that we uh, move forward with the redemption approach. Uh, and I've had communications with the prior owner in that regard, and they are interested. And then just housekeeping for parcels 22, 3, and 4. They're all in good standing under current installment, uh, installment sales contracts, so no further action is required. I just mentioned that. And lastly, parcel 26 is currently in bankruptcy, and we've been advised to let that run its course before we do anything with it. So with that, uh, that constitutes my recommendation to move these matters forward. All right. And Mr. Bacon, you have any questions? Before we get too far, now that that's been introduced, um, does anybody from the public wish to speak on this item? Okay. None. Who approval? Second. And discussion. Huh? I didn't see, um, and maybe it's been presented before, the copy of the actual policy. Um, I, I agree with every single one of these, but I do have a question regarding the first item that's in the recommendation, which is based upon the relatively small monetary value. The question I have is um, what is the relatively small value in the sense of what's the threshold going forward? I mean, is it 1000 bucks? Is it uh, less than five? I mean, what, what are we going to be using as a guideline? I didn't see the I didn't see it in there, and I apologize. Yeah, the, the guideline doesn't give any guidance mm -hmm. in that regard. Okay. Um, I use that as a I use that as a partial rationale as to um, as to why we should retain it. Uh, okay. There's not much value that we would reap um, based on the last assessed value of these properties. Uh, they range from five hundred dollars to two to ten thousand, and I honestly don't you know I, I don't have a great degree of confidence that those numbers are they're certainly not appraisals or market numbers. Um, if we retain them, we can always revisit this and choose to sell them in the future as well. Thank you. And uh, just a quick question, sort of a related sort of a related question. For the properties that we think we're going to offer for public sale, do you have any sense of might occur this year, so what kind of revenue flow that might be? Is it? I've not done that financial analysis. I fully intend to advance that this year. Yeah, uh, I, yeah. would, uh, I believe I will be bringing those back. Uh, incidentally, the council will approve all of those sales yeah. individually. Uh, I fully expect to return that to you in this calendar year. Um, I don't have an estimate of what that might bring. Just, just looking for that that extra. I know. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 it's the season. So. <laughs> revenue. Thanks, Tom. <laughs> yep. uh, and anybody? Anybody else? Mm -hmm. All right. And, well, um, the first and the second. So, all those in favor? Not as unanimous. Thanks so much. And order number 15 dash 033, action request to set the date, time, and location of the school budget validation referendum for Tuesday, June 9th, 2015. Wish to speak on this matter. And none. I will close comment. And pleasure of the council. Move approval. Second. And discussion. Yes. Is this the point in the procedure that I introduce an amendment, or is that is that later? Um, I guess I would like to at least consider introducing an amendment. Um, suggesting that the following language could be added. Um, the following is a non-binding expression of opinion for the consideration of the town council and school board advisory question. That would be, do you favor the acquisition of laptops by the Scarborough Duke School Department um, 
for high school students at an initial cost not to exceed $750,000. And that was in the form of a motion. So is there a second? And second. We have second. And discussion. Uh, discussion please. Yeah, I, I think you know, for me, this is this is this is not about whether the laptops are a good idea or a bad decider, idea. It's really about who should decide. And actually, I'm kind of still on the fence about it. But really, the thought was, and you certainly heard it from some of the some of the comments tonight. Um, and I've heard, actually, I've gotten a lot of emails this year about the school budget and the overwhelming, almost every single email has been, let the voters decide. And this to me is kind of an issue, this should be an issue that the voters decide. It really should not be a council decision. I, I think we should really do it. I think there is a spirit um, in the charter that these type of expenditures um, by the charter legally that doesn't need to, but I think the intent was for purchases of this magnitude because it, there, there's two things. One, it's it's the purchase of that this year, but there's also an ongoing cost of this. So what's in the in the budget? There's there's different numbers, but say it's somewhere between 750 because they're still finalizing what the proposal is at a million. Um, but over six years, that's really a proven expenditure of 1.5 million between 1.5 and 1.8 million dollars. So it's, it's a pretty significant issue. And so this motion is really is let's let the voters decide, let them get engaged, let them make a decision. Um, and so that was sort of sort of the thought. All right, and I have a question. Sure, Sean. So under the re first referendum question number one, it says, do you favor approving the school budget? The question I have is the definition of budget in this sense. Does that include, and this is maybe to the town manager who then can defer this to the town clerk, does that, uh, I don't know what it, I can't remember, does that include CIP? You're also approving the CIP? I believe it does. Mm -hmm. Because that's what is going to be on the 20th, right? Yes. Okay. And anybody, Jean Marie? Um, I, I am not in favor of this motion. Um, to be honest, I don't know what are, what are we sending to referendum? The voters, nothing's been decided yet. I know the school board's meeting tomorrow night. We've got a joint workshop next week. I think it's premature at this point to talk about putting anything for referendum. Uh, I know Peter talked about the number of emails he's received. I've counted my emails, and I've gotten 48 emails in favor, 21 against. So, you know, that's what I that's what I see. Um, I certainly understand people's concerns about um, the increasing taxes in the town, uh, and I'm certainly for tax stability. Um, but I, I, I just don't think that I think we're premature in, in even considering sending this to referendum. Yeah, I, I think, and I. As far as addressing that issue, I think the reason that it, that's here tonight, there's also a timing issue. We haven't reviewed it. We haven't gotten that information. But in order for it to be, and Tom, maybe you can help, in order for it to be anything on the ballot, it has to be decided tonight, correct? So, so this isn't really an issue about should the laptops. It's really about should it be a referendum item for our public, the constituents, to decide. And that's, that's sort of the reason that it's here. Yeah, it's, and, and Tody, please, you're the election um, <laughs> person. But uh, as I understand it, uh, with June 9 as the chosen date for the validation vote, it would make sense, at least in my estimation, that this be included on that same, uh, at that same day. Because of requirements that ballots completed and available for early voting or absentee voting. That's correct. We need to back up and, and approve this warrant this evening. So, in fact, the, the, the warrant is available. Um, in time for absentee voting. So that's really why it's on your agenda or up for consideration this evening. Um, and, and I certainly understand that, you know, timing, if we were to put <coughs> this out to referendum, however, there's nothing that says we couldn't decide on May 20th that we wanted to go to referendum and have another referendum down the line. It doesn't have to be on this ballot that's coming out June 9th. I th again, I think it's premature. Well, 
I'm, I'm not following the timeline. I do understand why I think there's a preference to have it on the referendum for June 9th because um, the fact is that um, for several years we've had an opportunity or the community has rejected the first reading or I should say the first referendum in a couple of seasons. So in order to make sure that we have subsequent referendums before the end of the fiscal year. Um, so, but, but the question I have is then why aren't we deciding what the school board, uh, what the budget actually is as well as the towns because I would think that you'd still need to post that same ballot um, so that they can decide that. So, I'm, so maybe through the town clerk, I can understand. Absentee ballots have to be made available seven days prior to the final vote on the budget. However, when we issue those ballots, they cannot be received back until after the mm -hmm. vote of the budget. But by law, the way it's written, okay. we're required to have those ballots available to the public seven days prior to the final vote. See, I knew you were smarter than all of us. <laughs> <laughs> if I can follow up, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I too am not in favor of this. Um, the fact is, it's already going to be the, the total question is already going to be on the on the referendum question. Guarantee it's a subset of the existing CIP request, or however that is being presented. Um, so there is an opportunity already for the citizens to reject that if they so choose. As a result, um, if anything, I would hope that uh, the council would consider that the three questions I think that's been referred to as the Goldilocks questions of too high, acceptable, or too low may be modified because I know that was one of the uh, recommendations or questions at the forum where it's a little bit more specific. Um, while I wouldn't want this to be too lengthy of a ballot because um, there are many options, I mean, um, if you think about the yes and the no, um, there's going to be six questions under there at the minimum, let alone now we're going to put in there also about whether or not they support the laptops. So. Um, uh, but I'll be honest with you, I actually fundamentally disagree with the request because uh, th there is a process one in place. And, and by the way, this also ties into the request or the recommendation that the, bu this, the town's budget goes to the citizens. Um, there is a democratic process in this town. It's been in place since um, the selectmen uh, converted and the citizens voted to go from a selectmen process to a town council and manager process that allows for um, the entrust both of our organizations uh, to make reasonable and, and responsible decisions. Um, and then if we don't and it becomes unfavorable, then there is a referendum process to recall that process. Um, and so at least on the town side, as I apply it to this particular issue, um, you know, that, that referendum process says they need to get, uh, I believe it's 25% of signatures mm -hmm. from the last gubernatorial, and then it goes back to referendum if we make a wrong decision. So. Um, well, this um, will be decided by the voters already. Um, you know, maybe we should be looking at the three questions and being able to better define what they are so that we can take that into consideration. Uh, uh, this is really a complicated question. We're talking about an, kind of an ad hoc, uh, informal polling, straw poll referendum as opposed to a formal referendum. Mm. And I don't like ad hoc processes uh, when, when you're dealing with the public because it creates confusion. Uh, this isn't like buying a truck. <clears throat> this is involved, uh, involves launching a one-on-one -on -one computing program at the high school. Uh, <clears throat> it's elaborate. It's a substantial program. It involves the purchase of equipment, the purchase of software, the purchase of licenses, uh, network support uh, has to be enhanced. Uh, we have to hire uh, IT technical support people. There's a whole range of things involved here. Uh, <clears throat> I have really kind of two basic viewpoints on, on this whole issue. <clears throat> One is I think any reasonable person would say, we have long since passed the point where we don't realize that computers are an integral part of the educational process. That we've, we've waited to this point is one thing. There are always uh, restraints, budgetary restraints, but now is the time to do it. Uh, 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 so I, I fully support the idea of advancing this program. <clears throat> My other viewpoint, and I've expressed this before, to most people here, it's expensive. 
and and we're and we're committed to trying to maintain some predictable budgets. Uh, this doesn't come just as a capital uh, a capital investment, you know, where you've got 20 years. We're talking about adding probably 300,000 or more every single year to the budget once we adopt this program. So it has a huge financial effect. Uh, and so, I mean, uh, we had a joint finance committee meeting, school and town uh, a few days ago. A proposal was submitted for consideration that would uh, uh, be able to lessen the tax impact. Uh, uh, on our taxpayers, and uh, I found it quite appropriate that we move in that direction because I think we need to lessen the tax impact, and we have to find ways to both advance the uh, schools' programs because the things that they were submitting are clearly appropriate and, and would contribute to the benefit of our community uh, in terms of uh, advancing uh, education but we have to balance it against the cost. Uh, and uh, and that's a, that is a huge issue uh, for me. So I'm, I'm kind of thinking I'd like to see the discussion that started the other day about how to make it have a reduced tax impact on us continue to go forward. And I think the school finance committee is going to meet to continue that discussion. Uh, and that's quite appropriate. Therefore, Things are up in the air. For me to support this at, at this time just seems inappropriate. So I really can't at this point. Yeah, I'd just like to kind of address a couple of things. I mean, my intent here wasn't, I mean, I, I, I hear you, Bill, and I, I'm kind of in the same place. I'm not sure where I stand. This isn't about the laptops per se. But what it, it is about is who should decide. And the problem is, is Sean, I hear you, that the problem with capital improvements, when a school budget gets approved, no matter what that number is, that capital improvement will automatically get approved because it's, that's just the way the budget works. When the voters sign off on the school budget, they're signing off on the capital improvements. So whatever number gets approved will include the laptops. And what I, I, this is only trying to tease out, you heard through the controversy tonight, and I, the feedback I've gotten, you know, you cited numbers, and you heard folks tonight, this is really kind of a issue that people feel very passionately about on both sides of the issue. So this isn't about whether it's the right thing or the, you know, it's more about who should decide. We really should ask our constituents, instead of us making the decisions for them, that it's time and it's the right investment, it's their money, they really should have an opportunity to let us know if they support it or not. That's the intent of bringing it forward, is let the voters express their views. <laughs> And that gives us all a better sense of where the community is. After all, we're supposed to be here to represent them, not for us to decide for them how <coughs> to spend their money. So that, that was the intent. Um, I kind of agree with Peter. Um, I also agree with Bill. Uh, Bill brings up an excellent point. This isn't really about capital budget anymore. This is about a new program in the school department, and it's it's not a, a one-time deal. It's an ongoing program, and it really should be a line item in their budget, their operating budget. They, to me, it shouldn't really be capital. Um, and it's more about how is it going to be funded. But it would be interesting. I. You know, to throw something like this out uh, in a time when when revenues are just up in the air all over the place, um, people in this town have a, a lot of opinion about the way we spend money. And the more input that we can get from them, I think the better off we'd be in the long run. Not that the town council really has anything to do with it. This is school budget. We're bottom line. Mm -hmm. Come on. Yeah, um, I did want to mention, so uh, first, um, just a fact. One is, if I calculate correctly, 
there's probably been four charter review committees since the enactment of our charter. And never once, I don't believe they have ever recommended that we change the process that we currently have, which I respect based upon their recommendations. That doesn't mean a future charter committee could not make a recommendation that would change it. I would need to verify it, but obviously by the fact that it's still in the charter, it must have either been introduced and failed or never introduced to change it. Um, and they tend to be generally conservative um, in the sense of making sure that the citizen's opportunity for involvement is um, always increased and better going forward. Um, I did want to mention, because it's been a couple of times, so fire trucks generally cost more than $400,000. Mm. Just as it was presented last year and voted on, every single one of those generally will be sent to bond. I'm sorry, it will be sent to the voters for approval. So th there was a statement made by um, a citizen that you know, somehow implied that we've been inappropriate in making that decision. Well, the fact is that the citizens did approve that. Um, because that item is um, included. Um, last is, you, you know, Peter, uh, I totally respect what your intentions are. We've talked about it a little bit. I'm not questioning the intent here. Um, I just simply fundamentally disagree in that process because I do believe that the citizens um, in the majority trust what we do as well as the school board. And, Ed, I, you know, I agree. It's, the fact is the school board decides where the money is spent. The citizens decide how much they decide where it is spent, and technically speaking, just like the operating budget, the school board can decide after it's approved to realign their budget and spend it on something different that aligns with mm -hmm. what they think is strategically needed for the school system. So simply, whether we put it in at 750 or whether we do it at the 900 um, in, as the overall number, they're charged with that authority. So to suggest that um, you know somehow it's going to absolutely be done, the fact is they technically could actually change it. I hope they don't. But um, this, uh, I think there's a little misconception about their authority to be able to do that. Because they can. They can sit there and say, you know what, we need it for something else. And they are allowed to do that. Mm -hmm. but, but, but Sean, I think, I think in order, sort of, we've talked a lot about transparency and full disclosure. The number that voters see when they go to the polls to approve the school budget for next year won't have a dollar one in there for the laptops because the laptops are in capital improvements, which they don't see that number. So they're not really approving. So for you to say that it's we're approving a number, it's what I'm just trying to do is to make sure the citizens understand that they're, they're approving the operating budget, but the capital improvement is a cost that's coming in future years. And as, and as pointed out by Bill, it's a longer term commitment. The number that we're talking about is two to three times that, that amount over time. So I just think I would rather err on the side of being transparent and open and giving, turn this over to voters, let them decide. And this, you know, this really the charter, at least in the conversations I've had with those that did craft the charter, it was meant to apply to <coughs> these types of things. The language in there doesn't support it the way it is without a legal opinion. But some of the original people that drafted the charter said this would be the type of thing they had intended that voters should weigh in on. So I'm just trying to respect that. That's that's why it's here. So. All right, my turn. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, <clears throat> I have a couple of thoughts on this item. Um, I, I've, I've personally gone back and forth. I believe, by and large, that the intent laid there in the charter and, and just because you draw something up many 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 years ago is a prime example of you can't predict for everything mm -hmm. um, I, certainly um, I was here as a new counselor when Charter Commission was active it got quite a bit of a staff and that was not necessarily reflective of the time but um, ultimately it didn't pass out of Charter Commission to, to go to referendum as being a higher num number uh, this, this is my position on this item for tonight is I don't have enough information on the proposal. And what happens with the proposal is going to dictate how I feel about whether this needs to go to referendum or not. Uh, I feel a little differently about this number when there's a parent buy-in. Because at that point, it becomes a loan. 
And so I can justify it to me. I can say, all right, I'm in a shade of gray right now because there's an intent question, but it's really more of a loan. And, and I can live and play within those shades of gray. Um, if it's not, and then it's a full expenditure, I happen to be in agreement with Peter that I believe it belongs as a referendum question. Uh, because you're not talking about a one-time purchase, you're talking about a shift in how we deliver something. So again, I think that intent kind of falls into that, um, into that charter piece. Um, how do we want to deliver things? And how do we want to deliver large things? Um, I, I'm not afraid of referendums because either they stand on their own merit or they don't. We've never, to my knowledge, not passed a fire truck. Um, we've never, you know, we passed a school. We passed an expansion on the high school. I, I mean, you advocate what the need is and you put the facts out and, and, and people agree with you, um, it should pass. If it doesn't, then you know that you were fundamentally wrong. So, I, again, I'm not afraid of the referendum process. process. <coughs> I do, however, want to preserve my right as a counselor for a motion to reconsider, depending on where this proposal goes. In order to reconsider, I must vote with the majority. I, I, and that's a procedural, I am just kind of putting that out there. So my intent, because I can hear, <laughs> I can hear and I can count, believe it or not, not very high. <laughs> uh, I know where the votes are going, so I, I'm reserving my judgment for the next meeting, because depending on how this proposal shakes out, I may be supporting you, Peter, in sending this to a referendum at some point. It does not necessarily need to be when we do the school validation vote. It could just as easily be in November, or we could have a special election over the summer. There's more than one way to, to skin a cat. So, um, with that, oh, I thought we were going to vote. Come on, John. No, well, I have, a I have a question. <laughs> no, I have a I, Well, I understand. And after 10 o'clock, no one knew business, right? I agree. Um, a question. Um, I just want to make sure that it's understood. We do have legal opinion that says that we are acting properly and have acted properly in the past because I want to make sure that no one interprets that we are doing something illegal or inappropriate I, from a... I believe that there was nothing that prohibits, although we have an opinion that we can move forward with it, there is nothing that prohibits us from sending it to referendum. Okay. So, is that correct, Tom? Uh, certainly you could. Okay. I, I'm sorry, what I meant about the legal question was more about the capital expenditure itself mm -hmm. and the $400,000 question around intent and that is that the legal opinion is that even though this is greater than $400,000 because of how it is administered, it does not violate the actual charter. Yes, I do have a legal opinion. Okay, I that's what I wanted to share that with you that, mm -hmm. that says that. Thank you. So, anybody else want to speak? Mm -mm. All just just, just one other question. Um, this is a non-binding expression of opinion. Mm -hmm. So regardless of how it comes out, it doesn't make any difference. Right? Informal polling is not a good idea. That's what it says here. The following is a non-binding expression of opinion. Mm -hmm. Non-binding referendum question. Right. It's the same as, do you think that the, the non-binding expression of opinion of the school board uh, the school budget is too high, is it accept acceptable, it's too low, well. it's an opinion. I don't know why we're making such a big deal out of it. I just want to know what people's opinion are. Go ahead. Oh. Jim Murray? I can answer that. <laughs> um, I think it's, I think it's a, bit, a bad precedent to sign, send something out like this as a non-binding expression, to be honest with you. Either you're going to vote yes or you're going to vote no, and I agree with Sean's interpretation that it's included in the budget validation as it is, to be, to be honest. So I, I just think it's bad precedent, and uh, that's one more reason why I absolutely would not want to see this go out, at least worded in this way in particular. Anybody else? All right. So all those in favor? Of the amendment. The amendment. And that's two, and all those opposed, and that is four. Now, back to the main motion. Act on the request to set the date and time and location of the school budget validation referendum for Tuesday, June 9th, 2015. And any other discussion on the main motion? 
And seeing none, all those in favor? And that is unanimous. And um, I do need to just take a moment uh, <coughs> to, uh, if I could have a quick consensus. It is past 10 o'clock. There is no new business after 10 p.m. Unless um, fine folks decide that you would like to maybe suspend rules and, and, and take up the next item, which is um, an act to, to move forward with um, our last workshop on paging throw. Yeah, I would move to suspend the rules and take up order number 15 035. 34. Second. And all those, in which you do have to vote on to suspend the rules. So, yes. all those in favor of suspending the rules? Oh, that's one, two, three. <laughs> <laughs> All those in favor of suspending the rules to take up the last yeah. item. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so, order number 15-034, act to charge the Energy Committee to review the PAYS Grill program to study and recommend viable methods for achieving and reducing waste and saving money. Prepare a town-wide plan and develop recommendations for the town council and provide a report to the council one year from the date of approval of this order. Is there anybody that wishes to speak on this item? We got one. Oh, really? <laughs> um, I'm I'm against the pay as you throw, but that's because I'm a big recycler. So, I, and I don't even put my cans out every week. I mean, I'm just, I, and I put the recycling out way more than I put the trash out. So, coming from that perspective. Oh, Marge the Sanctus, 54 Beach Ridge Road. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry. I was trying to be so quick. Thank you. Um, but I know that there are tags on each can, and I did write a little thing into the paper saying, can't we, can't we track by the cans and, and only, you know, you know, that's carrot and stick, and only do the stick for the people that aren't recycling, because um, I don't want to start buying bags if we're, we recycle for the environment. So then we're going to go and buy bags and add to the environment problem? I mean, it just doesn't make sense to me. Um, to spend money that we don't need to spend. We have these nice re reusable cans that we use all the time than to start buying bags and add to the waste stream. Um, now we have bags. So I just, I just am opposed, you know, environmentally to, to the whole concept. Reuse, recycle, don't start adding to that. And I think with the tags on every can, there should be a way that we can see what I mean, you know the weight, you know the weight every time you dump, so that we should be able to see who's recycling and who isn't and address it directly to the people who don't recycle. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. no. Robert Rovner, Walking Street. As a town uh, in this uh, pay throw program, have you ever considered just letting all the residents hire their own trash company and <clears throat> get the money out of the budget completely? Everybody can, the council would approve different vendors to come into town, and then we as citizens could choose the vendor we wanted to use. Um, I can just give you my own experience in two different states. <clears throat> in New Jersey, uh, waste management handled all the trash in the communi community we were in. On Mondays, they picked up all the grass cuttings. On Tuesdays, they picked up all the recyclables. And on Thursdays, they picked up all the garbage. In Colorado, where my mother-in-law lived, they contracted with their own private vendor. And if there were 10 houses on the block, there might be 10 different choices. The majority of the time was there were maybe two or three. It's just a suggestion, but this would eliminate a problem for you and would free money up in the budget. Thank you. Anybody else? Drew Stevens, Six Ray Lane. I'm sorry I don't have the name of the company right now, but I work with an organization in Portland that started using a composting company, and is that something Scarborough is considered doing? They they give you the bins that you can use. You then get the compost picked up by the company, and they deliver soil that you can then use for landscaping, and it, it ends up paying for itself. It doesn't cost you a dime to do it, and it's, a, it's an organization. Um, I know large groups in Scarborough, they'll give you different, um, in Portland, that have used the service. They've been using it for over a year, and it's been working out for them. Has that been something considered by you? I guess 
Well, I think perhaps the double in the wording. Um, I, I think um, you have your, or I, I'm running off of the agenda. Um, to study and recommend viable methods for achieving and reducing waste and saving money. So oh, as part thing. of their task is to, yeah. you know, because that was one of our, our mm -hmm. consensus coming out of that workshop was to review, you know, alternatives, you know, recycling, composting, yeah. you know, that they should be tasked with coming up with a broad series of. I'm, I'm just wondering if that is yeah. a, that has been reviewed already. That it hasn't been reviewed, but mm. but that's what we're tasking the committee to to do. Gotcha. Look at all you know, concepts, proposals. Would it be helpful um, to give you that information, mm. or do you uh, already have that? Yeah, it certainly would be. Uh, be in touch with me. I'd you? be pleased to have that. Okay. Yeah, I know they've been. They do a lot of cooking, and right. so they have a lot of compostables, and it's been working for over a year. So I'll right. I'll get you that information. Thank Thanks, you. Drew. Thanks. Sure. <laughs> Uh, does anybody else wish this to be done with? And seeing none, we will go ahead and close the council. Move approval. Second. And any discussions? Tom. Um, so this is a very nice solution to a very difficult conversation to some extent. Um, the first is that I do have a question. Um, I would like to see actually um, potentially, and I'd go on the advice of the manager. And the la very last uh, statement, it says provide a report. Um, a report is useful, but a recommendation is more important and um, more useful. So I would hope that um, if everyone else agrees, I'd like to amend so that there is actually a recommendation coming from them. Um, and secondarily is that uh, with the two speakers, I hope that you might be willing to be um, participants. Um, I'm not sure if there's any openings on the Energy Committee, but uh, definitely being participants at the committee level will be very useful. If I could just point out, uh, I think hmm. if you back up one line there, it does say prepare a townwide plan and develop recommendations for the council. I might suggest it's already considered. It, it might be nice okay. to have a formal report so we can have something to react to. Yep. That's true. It's in there. I should mention we had initially drafted a new ad hoc committee, but um, Almost the same day we completed that, uh, the Energy Committee convened, oh, yeah. and to a person, they were excited about tackling this issue. Cool. So um, that's why it was drafted this way, and it makes perfect sense mm -hmm. to the committee. Uh, many of these issues touch uh, the sorts of things we're already talking about, and I provide staff to this group, so I'll, I'll be intricately uh, involved throughout as well. Okay. Any, anybody else wish to comment? All right, and all those in favor? That is unanimous. Thank you. All right, item number nine, standing and special committee reports and liaison reports. Peter, we'll start with you. <coughs> Given the interest of time, uh, nothing significant to report. So <laughs> 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 yeah, it is sort of late. Uh, no, no meeting. No meeting. Um, I'm going to shuffle that that way. I, Jean Marie? Oh, oh yes. Just real quickly, long-range planning, um, they're going to be having an event called a charrette, uh, and I, I forget the dates, it's the weekend of June 5th and 6th, I believe, at Higgins Beach, just to get input from all of the citizens at Higgins Beach about zoning changes, of making zoning a little more reasonable at Higgins Beach. And we're meeting this Friday at 8 a.m., bright and early, before I'm awake, but that's okay. Um, on long-range facility planning, and I can't remember what the other thing is, but anyway, that's it. The brain fried. We, as a finance committee, met uh, numerous occasions. I'll let the chair uh, address uh, the details of that, and that's been most of the committee work. The energy committee uh, I met, and as it was reported by the town manager, uh, very strongly uh, expressed interest in this uh, this effort to try and find a better way to do uh, trash and recycling. And there is a big composting piece to it. If you look at the data from Waste Zero, it isn't just more recycling. There, uh, we need to find a way to uh, introduce composting into into the equation. Um, so I actually have a few things for finance in particular. I'm going to pass these down. There's actually, I believe, four handouts. I thought it was important that uh, the Finance Committee provide you with some information and, and data that has been provided to us 
just so that you can peruse it and um, if you uh, have questions so that we are prepared not only for the workshop next week but also for the uh, May 20th issue. Um, in, in that packet there is really, um, oh, sorry, three, three pieces of information. Yeah. Four, sorry. First is the uh, Joint Finance Committee meeting uh, presentation that was given to us uh, regarding the responses from the superintendent regarding major issues um, or three primary, I think it was three or four, uh, questions and um, issues that were brought forward and you provided detail. That's really supported then by two additional pieces. First is the five-year data history regarding Scarborough's um, placement in comparison to, I believe, what he called his, uh, the cohort of comparable communities um, that dealt with per pupil um, expenses or per pupil trends. And last, is, um, I will state, is, um, which is the thicker package, is a 20-year analysis um, that really trends out over that 20 years what has been the actual performance um, both um, in comparison to those cohorts but regarding um, our average as it compares to the cohort but then also our average in spending as it compares to the state. Um, I think it's extremely useful information and I wanted to uh, express my gratitude to the superintendent and his staff for presenting that. Um, the last piece is really um, want to give you at least a heads up even though we haven't made a re final recommendation on the total budget. The next document really has been um, the one piece that we have come to conclusion um, barring any future changes at the, at the next meetings is really where we have started looking at on the municipal side regarding expenditures and <coughs> revenues. Um, the manager is also, this was the manager's um, um, recommendations um, as well as the recommendations of the, of the committee and I'll um, probably provide greater detail at the 20th meeting regard, regarding the difference. In addition, there are two tax competition sheets, I'm sorry, four tax competition sheets that provide the detail of what the impact of those decisions have been. Um, it does take into consideration some um, adjustments that were made by the superintendent that haven't been fully deliberated um, at, the, at the finance committee level, but um, at least it's there so that you can understand what is happening and I'd be happy to make myself available um, to answer any questions. Um, last, uh, not last, there's a couple more items. First, I um, want to mention that um, we do have the joint workshop between the town council and the school board and not just our committees, but really as a, as a whole governing body that's on uh, May 13th and that discussion starts at 7 p.m. and it is about their budget. Um, that will hopefully give us um, direction. Uh, the town council's finance committee will be meeting at 4 o'clock on that same day to begin its dialogue, um, if not make a decision so that we can then um, make a recommendation um, or at least make known what our recommendation is at the workshop um, and provide some advance information um, for your consideration uh, before May 20th. And um, the other item I did want to mention is um, I really wanted to thank, um, having sat up on the stage with the finance chair of the school board and um, our staff, really wanted to say thank you to um, everyone who participated, especially those who helped organize that. Uh, Tom and um, the superintendent were a driving motivator behind that. I think it was extremely successful. Um, I believe I heard a, a comment that we had about 140, um, 140 participants. Um, uh, of course, uh, many of them were, um, we included in that uh, school board members, town council members, as well as staff that were there to provide information that was available. Um, so the big piece I really wanted to mention was I really wanted to thank Kevin Freeman, um, who was our moderator and again um, participating in town activities because he did an incredible job um, in, or, in both organizing but also making the presentation. Last but not least, as chair, I do think it's important, I've made this promise when I did become chair that um, as questions are asked as part of the budget process that we should be able to answer them relatively quickly. So I wanted to answer uh, four questions that came up as part of the public statement. Um, the first is um, I, I want to make sure that it's understood that my personal comments about my personal opinion, I did try to deflect and make sure that um, people understood that it may not represent the entire consensus of the council. So I hope that people understood that because <coughs> while I tried to deflect it as many times as possible, it got to the end where they just uh, continued asking. So I, I wanted to stress that um, um, I believe what I said regarding forwarding the budget item, what I said uh, was that, um, that, it, that the issue would be forwarded to the for consideration by the town council. I didn't say it would actually be consideration because that's something that we would have to decide as a whole. So I just wanted to clarify that. 
um, because it hasn't been presented yet. And I have made in a conversation an update with the chairwoman. I have mentioned that that was one of the items that was asked from us. So um, I will um, rely on her leadership to, um, as well as others, to determine when that should come to the council if it should. Um, last is that um, I'll get rid of this one. Um, there was a question about how did this question um, come to the town council um, about the laptops. Um, the town charter is very clear. The school board approves the superintendent's budget and it's forwarded to the town council. It's only by means of the town manager that it is forwarded. So whatever their recommendation is, is what came to the finance committee. So it's not um, some conspiracy behind, well, why didn't it get stopped before? It says specifically that the superintendent and the school board forwards their budget to us. So um, that's why we are considering it. And then second, um, there were specific questions asked about, I think it was, um, I don't like naming names, but I wanted to mention that Ms. Gleistein asked some questions or had questions regarding laptops. I just wanted to mention that, that those questions would be appropriately forwarded to or should be forwarded to uh, the school board chairwoman uh, because their finance committee and their board has been very forward and very open about answering questions and I would rely on them to answer that because it's specific to their school mission. So with that, thank you. Um, just real quick, one committee, um, <clears throat> appointments committee met this evening. Um, we do have some names to post. Um, we have Chris Carrick, uh, an at-large member with a term, um, full voting member, sorry, with a term to expire in 2016 on the Pest Management Committee. We have Eric Snow is, is a first alternate with a term to expire in 2016 on the Coastal Waters and Harbor Committee. Selfish Conservation Committee is Paul Erickson as first alternate, Erica Snow as a full voting member, both uh, with a term of 2015. And Zoning Board of Appeals, host James Hebert um, to the second alternate position with a term to expire in 2016. And that's it for appointment. You off to the town manager report. In the interest of time, just two quick things. Just to uh, follow up on the budget forum, uh, in the end, we took questions that evening and had some submitted in advance. Uh, to my surprise, the questions were almost evenly split. Uh, 2038 were town related. Some of those were processed and we answered in 37 for school. So that was kind of an interesting takeaway. And by our estimation, about 110 people were non staff related there. So I think that was an extremely good turnout. And just uh, I think you all received invitations, but the groundbreaking for the Waterstone retail uh, facility up off Gallery Boulevard, this is across from Lowe's, tomorrow at 10.30. I know Karen Martin from Setco and I'll be there, but I believe the, the invitation was extended to members of the council if you wish to go. Thank you. Across from Lowe's. Mm -hmm. uh, item number 11, council member comments. On the other end. Sure. Um, I just want to, we heard a lot this evening about the school's budget in particular, and um, I don't want uh, the lack of comments tonight from myself and my personal comments to indicate um, that I won't be willing to share those at the next meeting, because um, I will share um, my opinion at that time. Oh. Yeah, I would join in that. I thought it would be far more appropriate on May 20th to uh, offer uh, comments on uh, uh, more detailed questions about the budget. I would ditto those two, but I also told Jackie I would read an announcement. <laughs> Kiwanis Food Drive for the Food Pantry, uh, Thursday and Friday drop off during business hours, Bitterford and Saco Savings, and Ron Forest Fence, which is on Payne Road. And Saturday, 9 to 1, at the Black Point Church and at Dunstan Fire Station. We really are in desperate need of canned goods and dry goods um, for our, our neighbors in need. So any donations you can make for the food pantry would be great. Jackie, if you call her, and she's putting out her number here, so write it down if you want to know Jackie's number. It's 883 <laughs> 2451. Call her, and she'll come pick it up if you can't drop it off. So anyway, there you go, Jackie. <laughs> Everybody have a nice evening. <laughs> yeah.
Nothing new, just sort of what I've said in the past. So there's a lot of energy this year around the budget, so I just encourage you, there's a lot of good information that's out there. There's been a lot of, you know, joint things that have been published. Just everybody, just encourage everybody to get engaged, get informed, and show up at the polls to vote. Thank you. And I wish I could do that quick, but bear with me. Uh, <laughs> I do, uh, well, let me start with, we do want to offer condolences. As we, I did not do them last time, so I'm going to try to do them this time. Um, offer our condolences to the family of Matthew Brady, who is um, um, a local kid that grew up here that I think was a couple of years ahead of me, but um, to the family of Gordon Clark, the family of jo um, Charles Foley, and um, to the family of Roger Knight. Um, you might recognize mm -hmm. that name from Smiling Hill Farm, which is our West, you know, Westbrook Scarborough mm -hmm. line there. Um, they have their own property here. So again, um, our condolences to, to those that have um, passed on. And um, <clears throat> real quick, I do just want to, in the spirit of recycling and, and all those lovely things, uh, Public Works is hosting on Saturday, May 9th from 8 a.m. to noon uh, their household hazardous waste drop-off right there at Public, Public Works. Um, and then exceptionally quick, um, and I apologize because, again, it's getting late, um, it did offer to speak a little bit about the budget process. I'm going to do that as quickly as possible. We do not direct anybody as to how they submit their budget. There's no manager submits, the superintendent submits. There's no action of the council that approves or rejects or changes that submittal. It gets submitted. Um, we as a council at first reading can take that number up or we can take any other number up. It's kind of irrelevant because as submitted is its own action, and as we start the process at first reading, it's really just that it moves the process forward. Uh, as we move along in that process, second reading is, of course, when the town house gets approved or disapproved, and we play with it on the floor and debate it and move things around a little bit. And then, of course, we do something with the school side, and then we send it to voter referendum. Um, that is pretty well black and white. That's not, um, you know, we, we don't necessarily create the rules. We, we, we work within the rules set to us with the charter and the main set, you know, some of the main state of Maine's rules. Um, I know there was a question about could we speak to, you know, what, what authority we have. We, we kind of have none. <laughs> that, 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 that's the bottom line. We, we can't change those rules. It, it's by act of charter and it would be by act of main, main state law. You know, they would there are different things that come into play that we, we just don't control um, about how the process goes along. Um, but I did say I would kind of speak quickly to that, and that was a cognizant of what my vote was on, on first reading and towards the process. I was very cognizant of what my vote was. Um, with that, we'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Aye.